Abuyam and Man. Um, we're very excited that everyone's here. Um, this is going to be a really um, informative and interesting meeting, and I hope that um, you really have some good take home skills to, to use with you as you um, continue to screen for problem gambling uh, with this population. I'm Mary McMahon. I'm with the Office of Behavioral Health. You've probably seen emails or correspondence at some level with me. Um, I oversee the Addiction Counselor Training Program and Workforce Development for the Office of Behavioral Health, as well as the pro uh, Program Administrator for the Gambling Grants. So we'll be talking about gambling grants <coughs> here in just a little bit, so I'll give you some more information on that. Um, just some general housekeeping real quick. So the restrooms are um, out this way and to your left, and then around the corner. We do have some refreshments over here, so please help yourself to those. Um, and that, with that, I'm going to turn this over to um, Dr. Mike Carragher. Thank you, Mary. And uh, welcome, everyone. And I just wanted to welcome you to the University of Denver. I teach here in the Counseling Psychology Program. And I'm very thrilled to work with Mary in the Office of Behavioral Health, as well as uh, Larry Wall, who's the president of the Problem Gambling Coalition of Colorado, which is going to become an even much greater important force in the coming years. And you'll understand why uh, at the beginning of my presentation, there's big things that are happening in the gambling world. But with that, I'd like to introduce Larry, who's going to give you some information on electronic gambling and a number of other things. So Larry, thank you. Each of those core um, 
awareness, advocate treatment, promote research and education. So this would be kind of one of the symposiums, kind of working with OBH on, and how we could kind of promote uh, awareness and also education. We do participate in a couple other symposiums, as you'll see in a few slides here, such as the Winter Symposium uh, down in Colorado Springs at the end of July, or Jan January, it was just happened the 28th through 31st of this year. And then we also have um, CAP Conference coming out the Colorado Association of Addiction Professionals. That's June 21st and 22nd at the Radisson Denver South, um, that hotel down there. So the vision we have is to we envision an ever-increasing role in restoring and maintaining the quality of life in individuals and communities impacted by problem gambling. So really trying to pull not just kind of Denver, but how do we reach out to those communities that are in the mountains, those communities that are not accessible to a lot of services. So what can we do if it's like a, more of a telecounseling kind of visit for those if there's not a gambling counselor? Um, that's specific out in uh, like Durango. I don't think we have anyone down there. Alamosa, Pueblo. We really don't have certified gambling counselors in those type of areas of the state. So how do we kind of get the training to, uh, for addiction professionals or licensed professionals to expand that reach a little bit better? Um, our board of directors here, so we kind of have a wide range of those on our board from the governor's office, uh, to the library, Division of Gaming, Jefferson County Center for Mental Health, Rocky Mountain Crisis Partners, and the uh, Colorado Gaming Association, as well as um, Mary McMahon's on board as well. So advisory board, this is really crucial. So if uh, you're saying, what do I do? How do I get involved? This would be great to get involved on our advisory board, or we do have our board of director meetings, which is the second uh, Friday of each month from 8.30 to 9.30 at the Colorado Lottery Building, uh, the Gallery Building in South Colorado. So we really are looking for volunteers, participants, how we can get people involved. Um, we could only do it when we tap the community support. We have people that are helping push us forward. So we try to champion as much as we can as a board, but there's only so much we can do. But it's, I think, getting connected with the you know, therapists and professionals that are working in the field, and if they have a passion for what we're doing, to get involved and help to push this forward a little bit. Uh, so our, we have the Isle event space on May 11th. Uh, we wanted to build those bridges with the gaming industry and the casinos. So I went up and met with the GM of um, Ameristar, Lady Luck, and Isle Casino. They offered a space for us to really connect more of the casinos and see what they could do for prevention, uh, some education. I know Lady Luck, when I walked in, on uh, top of the ATM machines, they have some of our flyers. So it's how do we get that into, we have 32 casinos in Colorado. So Cripple Creek to Central City to uh, Blackhawk. So how do we get more awareness material, uh, materials out there and disseminated for those that actually have an issue or problem with gambling? So we're not saying we're not against gambling by any means. It's just that one to three percent is kind of the international national average that those that might have a problem gambling or that have an issue with gambling, how do we reach that one to three percent and provide those resources? So some facts. Colorado Gaming, the AGP, and the lottery revenue. So we're looking at a $1.4 billion industry. So there is cash kind of flowing throughout the gaming industry in Colorado, and this is 2016. So 2017 numbers kind of were just disseminated, so those are getting out there, and it looks like it increased just a little bit, even in 2017. Um, I think the next slide, so I included on here, the Colorado Casino, AGP, uh, we're at, um, let's see, it's 828 from 810. So 828 million from 810 million. So that's still a substantial increase for 2017. So it looks like if you just look at kind of the numbers going up, um, we did have kind of a spike back in the early 2000s, and I apologize, it's a little hard to see, um, but as you kind of went up to now 2016, <coughs> it's still increasing, so there is some revenue out there. Uh, we just have to tie it to kind of that workforce development, like how OBH has the grant to kind of fund the gambling counselors and trainings and treatment, uh, and how do we expand that to more prevention and awareness activities to get out in the communities. On that topic too, um, I know Lane is also on our board. <laughs> you work at the Jefferson um, Center for Mental Health, and that's one of the concerns um, that I'll touch on as I continue here, but uh, how do you bill and get paid 
for gambling disorder, right? So those that have a gambling disorder, they have probably another co-occurring, right? So depression, anxiety, bipolar disorder. So even if that's the major diagnosis, so the secondary or tertiary diagnosis to support that depression and anxiety could be gambling disorder. So everyone I know, mental health centers, I know treatment providers are saying, well, if I'm doing the service and I'm doing the treatment, how do I get reimbursed? So gambling disorder does not have to be the primary diagnosis. So if they're coming into you for something else, and we'll talk about this later in our workshop, what that primary diagnosis, the secondary or tertiary, could be a supporting gambling disorder. And that will help um, with your screening tools and how you work into the assessments. So I think a lot of people were just not asking, and how do we start to ask those questions, and how do we have the art to you know, uh, do that? Does that make sense? Uh, statewide game, uh, gaming statistics. So if you look, we have 33 casinos uh, as of July last year for until February. So that number was up to 38, I think 42 at the top. So some of them merge, some of them consolidate. So that's kind of where you see those numbers going up and down. Um, so this is kind of the gaming taxes that are shared. So for those, what is it, six, seven, eight months or so, about $72 million in taxes. And so people ask, like, well, where does that go? So where does that go is going to be coming up a little bit here. So the lottery sales revenues from 1983 were down to, what is it, 136? I'm going to look at this slide. 136.9 million up to 2016 is 594 million. So there's a thing called the GoCo cap. So who knows what GoCo is? Anybody? So GoCo is the Great Outdoors Colorado Trust. So in 1992, the Colorado voters uh, made the decision to take all the profits from the lottery, and 50% goes to the Great Outdoors Colorado Trust Fund, 40% to the Conservation Trust Fund, and 10% to the Colorado Parks and Wildlife. So it's kind of slated right on there, proportionate, what are those percentages that are going where? So I wish when we did kind of pass that 1992 amendment that we at least had one to three percent allocated to gambling disorder, or you know even one two percent for some prevention, education, awareness activities. If we just didn't know the prevalence in the state of what gambling disorder looked like, um, so GoCo funds are for fiscal year 18, 2018 are capped at 66.2. So everything over those funds roll over to the Colorado Department of Education for public school. So that's the capital construction, so new schools kind of developing and building those. So those are already set aside. <coughs> we're, <coughs> sorry. we're lucky to have the Colorado Lottery as a platinum supporter for us. So they do participate in our Problem Gambling Awareness Month. They spend about 20000 in um, marketing, ads, and distribution throughout the state, and it's really a targeted behind the scenes uh, those that are visiting fantasy sports or gambling, online gambling websites, those will, or will, you'll see their ads uh, that will pop up for problem gambling awareness months. So we should get some statistics back from them, what the click-through impressions and those type of rates are um, over the next couple, like I think in the next month or two. Yes, so we have... It just How often is that reviewed or there's a chance to say, okay, let's look at those numbers and maybe next time We'll put one to three percent towards, you know, gambling. Um, is that yearly they look at that, or every five years? Yeah. So excellent question. The question was, uh, how often are the percentages of where the lottery funds allocation go? How often is that reviewed? Is it yearly? Is it every five years? So what happens is there's the Colorado uh, Lottery Commission meeting. So that happens on a monthly basis. So I've started to go to a few of those to kind of you know, talk about what we're doing, kind of getting structured and organized. I think what's been lacking for a few of the years with the Problem Gambling Coalition, we kind of skated by, we floated along, we did some awareness activities, we did some outreach, but we really never kind of dug in and kind of said, how do we develop this organization? So doing that, um, going to the Colorado Lottery and asking them um, to slate something in, because remember, this is statutorily kind of written in, so that they have to kind of have a way to adjudicate and say, this is what I will provide to um, you know, the Problem Gambling Coalition and for these specific reasons. Anything over like 30,000 goes to the RFP process with the state or RFQ and that kind of uh, process. 
So that's why we're kind of right at the mark where they internally do the problem gambling awareness. They help out with the hotline, also funding that. Um, and we're just happy now that we have the $30,000 pretty much support from them to help with activities. And I really believe once we start reaching out to the 33 casinos that we see, even if we raise 2,500 as a, you know, a supporter, an industry supporter for us, 2,500 times 10 casinos, we're at 25,000. So it's amazing what we could do just with some small numbers. My goal for the year is 125,000 is what the budget we are. So right now, our operating budget has been traditionally about 40 to 50,000 a year. So we're um, at about 75,000 right now. So we have another 50,000 to go to hit our mark. And I really believe over the course of the next year, we'll be able to do that. I mean, we get five casinos or so, and we're kind of almost there. It's, it's amazing just putting that, and we get some treatment providers within the industry, um, nonprofit supporters for $1,000. Um, we came up with this tier, um, and you'll probably see that in a couple slides, but a supporting partnership. So we really get individuals, we get nonprofits, we get the industry, everyone involved, and really a part of what we're doing. So we kind of start that conversation. So the big hashtag and uh, topic for the Problem Gambling Awareness Month has been have the conversation, or have the convo is the hashtag. So how do we have the conversation and actually start talking about it? Um, we see so many people with mental health or substance use issues, but rarely do we learn how to ask the question pertaining to gambling. And more than likely, we're not going to have clients and patients that will volunteer the information that, oh, you didn't ask me about my casinos and my gambling issues. So even when you say, are there any other issues, they're probably not going to bring that up. So especially vets. So that's something that they really hold protective and it's a, you know, escape or a passion that they could go out and enjoy a recreational activity. So that's kind of where the lottery funds go. Some of our funding sources for problem gambling. Um, so lottery, PGM and the hotline, we have the Colorado Gaming Association. Uh, at 30,000 years, we have the Iowa 10, the Division of Gaming and Division of Racing. Uh, each contribute about seven, so about 14. We have the Colorado Association of Addiction Professionals at 1,000, and then we raise about, um, annually about 5,000 per year um, for the golf tournament. So we're hoping to increase that to about 10 this year by getting more industry involvement and really partnering, I think, with the mental health and addiction community versus practicing and being in our own silo and how do we build those bridges within our own disciplines to start to move things forward. So supporting partnership levels, we uh, passed that on the board in November 2017. So those are kind of the levels for industry treatment research, academic and government is about the 2,500 level. Uh, nonprofit thousand, and then there's some benefits, platinum and stuff. So you get a table and uh, a foursome at the golf tournament that we do at Arrowhead. So it's a pretty nice course as well. The new uh, the call center statistics. So we switched over July 2016, like I mentioned, uh, from Kansas to Colorado. Rocky Mountain Crisis Partners. They're the state hotline. So 24/7 mental health and um, substance abuse issues they handle. So a peer support line, we average about 141 calls per month. Now some of those calls are going to be calls not from the individuals themselves that have the issue. So we're looking at about 10 to 12 per month from the individual. So about another 20 to 30 per month are from those that are have a friend or know someone. It could be the individual themselves that are not admitting it's them, but calling in and checking out, well, where do I get resources? How do I send my spouse somewhere? What uh, treatment is available out there? Who are the providers? Those type of things. So I think that's still a substantial number of calls that are coming in through our 800 the hotline number, and it's routed to the crisis partners. So having that, I think there is something happening, and we have to just not overlook it and see how do we help those that are really calling. And right now, they are getting triaged to certified gambling counselors in Colorado through the Rocky Mountain Crisis uh, Price Departments. Um, scholarship contests. So one of the awareness activities that we do for the Problem Gambling Coalition is we offer a scholarship. First and second prize for high school or college students that um, will draft an essay regarding a topic that we uh, pick. So this year it would be inevitable crash. So we give them a topic, they have to include kind of the PGCC logo, the hotline number, the tagline, the inevitable crash within their poster. 
and then write an essay about kind of why why it's close to them, if it's impacted their family, friends, how is it meaningful. Um, so it's open high school, college students, and that's one of our awareness activities. So over the past few years, so some of the different topics that we've had was don't leave it to chance, a day in the life, and then the inevitable crash. So this year our winners are Joshua and um, Satalia, or Satali. Um, those are two winners, so we reach out to them. We normally go to kind of their high school, do kind of a, during their assemblies or something, do a little introduction, show the poster, kind of award them the check. So we actually send the check to their institution or college or wherever they're going, uh, versus just <laughs> providing them the check for 2000 or 1000 So we'll send it on behalf with their you know, student ID number to whatever college that they're going to, uh, to help with that tuition. So this is the first place winner this year. So it had the inevitable crash, it had our logo on it, and it had the um, hotline number. So it's amazing kind of even when we write out the rules and requirements for the scholarship contest, how rarely we get all three elements in the poster. <laughs> so sometimes it's written in the essay, but that was one of the requirements to put it all in the poster. So the inevitable crash not worth the risk. So you have kind of the playing card, a little bit more there. You know, someone you know, holding their head, is gambling affecting your life and others? If you or someone close to you has a gambling problem, please call the number and also on the website. So it was each a, actually a bonus. We even asked to put the website on it. We got four. So that was amazing. So that's Joshua.
uh, for thousand three hundred ninety five. Uh, what we did after we brought in was about 10825 So after we paid the golf course, kind of food, beverage, everything else, that's kind of what our overall raise was. There we go. So the National Council, so this was really exciting. So in July of 2019, so this year, so I took over as president in March of last year, um, 2017, and one of the keys was I've been on the national the affiliates committee meeting for a while, and then on the development committee for national um, council on problem gambling. So being that they always were talking about this national conference, and when I was looking, we never had a national conference for problem gambling in Colorado. So in the movement to create kind of more of awareness and change, there was an RFP that the states kind of um, had to participate in. So we completed the RFP, we got that submitted right before Thanksgiving, I think we would do like November 22nd. Um, so we had to go through kind of financials, fundraising, what are we gonna to do to host the event, hotel selection. So we actually won that RFP uh, right before the holiday time, it was like December 25th or 24th, right before the holidays really kicked in. They called us and said, you guys won it, so we were the finalists between Washington DC and us and they selected Denver. Um, so we were really excited that finally we could bring the national conference here. Uh, doing that is gonna be at the downtown, the Sheraton downtown Denver, so right on 16th Street Mall. We're looking, so if anybody has other suggestions, we're looking at Friday night event, of a great, really nice place to host it, that's a networking event. Uh, we're, we're not sure what the Colorado Rockies schedule looks like, but we're thinking about doing maybe kind of that outfield picnic kind of party networker networking event and then maybe doing kind of uh, some seats uh, that people could buy tickets to the um, game right afterwards. So, but that's if the Rockies have a game in town. So, and if not, we could either do, still do it there and tour the stadium and locker rooms and that kind of thing, or we could do Mile High Stadium. I don't know if I'm out of town, who's the Rockies fans or not, but <laughs> a lot of people might want to come see the Broncos Stadium and everything, maybe over the Rockies, so it's kind of torn between where we host that so we're gonna put out some bids to both of those stadiums and see kind of what we can do. Um, so right now we're working on about a three minute video for to capture and get people to Denver for the National Conference. Um, and that's uh, DU and Colorado Lottery are helping sponsoring partners with us on that, which is amazing. And um, so we'll show that in July, the conference is in Cleveland. So we'll show that video in July and hopefully start to get some interest in everyone coming to Denver. So we're expecting about 400 to 450 kind of um, attendees at the conference throughout the US. So a lot of the major states like Baltimore has a great program, Minnesota, uh, Connecticut, uh, Evergreen up in Washington State, um, Nevada. So trying to pull people um, in those respective affiliates to kind of tell their members to get out because it's always been on the East Coast now. Now it moved kind of Midwest and Portland was actually two years ago. But a lot of the conferences have been happening along the East Coast and now we have one kind of really in the west, Western slope there. Uh, so July 17th through 29th of 2019. So we already talked a little bit about the Problem Gambling Awareness Month, so that happens every March. Uh, what we're envisioning is next year, how do we reach more insurances and also mental health centers and uh, therapy or treatment providers in Colorado that's facilities or individuals themselves. So these were the other two conferences I mentioned earlier were the Winter Symposium in January 2018 and then also the CAP conference in June the 21st, 22nd and that's the hotel address. So uh, we are one of the gold sponsors so we get to, you know, some marketing materials, uh, outreach to them, as well as an exhibitor table and two registrations. So future opportunities. So kind of put this together near the end of last year when I was presenting for the Colorado Lottery Commission. And so we had those items, so I thought it would be nice just to keep those and just put like where we come from that presentation. Um, so we, OBH was nice enough to offer this uh, symposium for us and kind of get this organized. So this was a nice awareness activity when we were looking at doing a one day, two day, what could we do to offer actually continuing education units in Colorado um, or continuing education credits. Um, offering some classes, so we applied to NCPG uh, in early January before the Winter Symposium 
and then we're able to offer uh, continuing education credits now uh, for kind of until next January. So it's a year kind of, you get an approved provider number. So gambling specific credits, so if you're working towards your credential for NCGC one, level one or level two, um, so we'll hopefully be able to continue doing that for the next few years and have at least, you know, a book of CEUs that you could go to our website, watch online, and be able to fill out the surveys and, you know, get your certificate that way. So right now, unfortunately, a lot of the C providers are out of state. So I did my 60 hours in Florida, so I'm also certified down there, so it was nice because it was free for me. Um, but other states offer it as well, but some of them have a, you know, a fee that you have to pay for the training as well. Uh, next was kind of the OPH grant program. So we're looking at how do we increase kind of more certified gambling counselors in the state. So that's been really the push, I think, on OBH's part and our part is even though you're trained and people ask and say, well, what is the difference? So if I do addictions or if I do mental health, what is the addiction? Well, how come I can, you know, treat gamblers? Well, you know, if you have a gambler coming in and you're already treating them for anxiety and depression, you're probably already working on something, maybe not so much of a gambling specific issue. But what the gambling training really does, it really works into more of the financial approach. So when you have someone that has an addiction for substance use or that gets a DUI, the most kind of financial you really do is what's the cost of your drink or drug use, right? What is um, list out like, so what are the other sacrifices that you made because you didn't go to work and what did that cost you? And then, oh, now you're DUI, so how much did that cost you? 10,000 or so. So with the gambler too, you're working and working with the clients on multiple family issues that have to do with finances. So risking losing their house. So not having the rent payment, risking um, how many lines of credits that they have, not just credit cards, but bookies that they're on the hook with that they could actually jeopardize the safety of their family. So how do you kind of navigate that system and also make sure that the spouse, that it's a husband or wife, depending on who's gambling, how that person is safe throughout the process. So just saying, well, I'm the gambler, I'm gonna give my spouse the you know, checkbook and manage all the finances. We don't wanna promote domestic abuse and say, well, the checkbook's there, so if you don't get the money you want, then there's physical violence in the household. So how do you kind of set up a plan that's safe for that couple or that family to mitigate some of those risks? So, so the, the, the gambling specific training really goes through that. Trains you kind of, we have a lot of screening tools out there. And <clears throat> Dr. Berger will mention a little bit too about those uh, training uh, or the screening and assessment tools. But it's kind of how you ask those questions and lead them into your assessment. Just going straight off and asking, kind of like a mask and gas and all the screening tools that we use, and saying, oh, just fill this out and answer yes or no. So a lot of times what we've been seeing, and Dr. Lori Rugel has shown in her presentation, and she's one of the leaders within gambling disorders across the nation um, out of Baltimore, Maryland. Um, what she's saying is if you just do the screening tool, that's not good enough because people are just, no, no. Like, they're just gonna tell you no, but if you leave it into your assessment, craft your questioning appropriately, you're gonna get a better response from the client that will be involved and say, well, yeah, I do go up to the casinos. Okay, great, so, like, who came to you? Like, just a more of a casual conversation and say, well, are there times that you wagered more than you wanted, right? Are there times that you, you know, borrowed money from your family or friends? So starting to meet some of that diagnostic criteria, but more in kind of a relaxed kind of assessment um, conversational field than just here's the three questions answer this, here's a my bet screen, here's the size, circle it, oh I'm supposed to ask you these questions, but how do you do it a little bit um, more with more finesse, let's say. Lastly, um, develop a network of supporting partners and individuals. So that's where in November we came up with the supporting partner levels. So how can we kind of create more of awareness, get more involved in the community, and do a little bit more than we have in the past. Um, and that comes with a little bit more funding. So one of the things we wanted to do was also partner on DU, and we were talking to Dr. Berger about a research institute again. So kind of raising some money to be able to do some research on clinical assessments within the state, um, a wide range of different topics. So how does this work, like how does this clinical assessment match up against this? So he has a student and faculty team to back him up here, and that's one of the things that the Colorado Lottery, talking to them, they're looking at doing what's called a NASPL, um, and all these different terms. Um, it's a Responsible Gaming Verification, RGB kind of program um, that, like the holiday campaigns, 
not to blast out, you know, the Colorado lottery on all the things and buy scratch off, buy tickets right around the, you know, holiday time where people will use them as a stocking stopper. So how do we get more ads that say, don't use scratch offs to give to your kids as a stocking stopper? Uh, how do we prevent starting kind of that road early on and kind of push that a little bit further back? So those are some of those initiatives. Um, I think we're pretty much to the end. So we do have go to meetings. So some uh, couple uh, individuals that are getting called in or are online. So we could open up for questions if there's any questions. No questions. Did everyone get their coffee? <laughs> All right. Well, I will turn this over. I think Dr. Berger is next up. So he is my clinical supervisor, but I'm learning all the great knowledge from and approaches and treatment. So you're in for a wonderful presentation here. And he's going to touch on some of the sports uh, gaming, electronic gaming, some of the things that you saw under me are tied into his presentation. So, well, welcome, Dr. Berger. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Good to see you all. Um, I power, but I'm helpless without power. Any questions before we get started? Okay, what I hope to chat a little bit about this morning. Can you hear me without? No, this? no, no. We need it for the video. Okay, Sorry. here we go. <laughs> uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about screening and then talk a little bit about what the Office of Behavioral Health has available in terms of support in providing treatment services as well as providing financial support to any of you or, or anyone in the state that would like to continue their training for uh, a, a gambling certification credential. And Mary is going to uh, join me up here and, and and explain a little bit about the support services that are available for supervision and training. So let's see what we have here. This is Home Gambling Awareness Month, and the theme of that in particular this year is the importance of screening. And we're going to talk a little bit about that as soon as we get my PowerPoint. Going. Okay, so I'm going to point out uh, the pointer doesn't seem to be working. I guess it does it better. Can you see that? A little bit. Okay. Uh, all of this word letter salad at the end. The ICGC, International Certified Gambling Counselor 2, we're going to talk a little bit about that because that's what the state support is available for. It's getting the one or the two or the BACC, which is Board Approved Clinical Consultant. Um, Larry touched on the importance of getting specialized training in working with gambling disorders. And we're going to talk briefly about why that is the case. But even tip 42 from SAMHSA, Treatment Improvement Protocol 42, mentions that even certified trained addiction counselors should be wary of working with people with gambling disorders. And whenever possible, these clients should be referred to someone that has the specialized training. And we'll take a look at why that's the case. Advancing forward, three, two, one. Okay, 
another one too. Yeah, first, another big thank you to the Problem Gambling Coalition of Colorado and the Office of Behavioral Health, and you met both Mary and Larry. And I also want to thank Tammy, who's going to be presenting. Uh, but these are two very powerful organizations that are firmly behind increasing the amount of training and opportunities for health for problem gamblers in Colorado. So if we can jump to the next slide. Wait, wait a minute. What's going on here? How many of you know that at this very moment, there are thousands of people that are attending a free webinar? And the free webinar relates to sports betting. Sports betting is illegal is not allowed at the state level except in Nevada. What's happened is Governor Christie in New Jersey and the racetracks in New Jersey have filed a petition that has made it to the Supreme Court that invalidates that prohibition. And without going into great detail about how that prohibition against state gambling possibly violates federal regulations that have to do with imposing requirements on states that the federal government doesn't impose on itself. What is going on is the arguments were heard in December. Many people that attended those sessions at the Supreme Court where they heard pro and con about opening up sports spending in the states are all convinced that the Supreme Court is going to strike down the prohibition and that sports betting any day now will be deemed permissible. If, not if, it's almost a certainty this is going to happen. It could be this afternoon. When this happens, according to Keith White, the executive director of the National Council on Problem Gambling, this could lead to the single biggest expansion of gambling in our history. <coughs> a couple days ago, I get lots of email. This was one of them. Free webinar, Economics of Sports Betting. I find this in my inbox. Next slide. So, to paragraph. Global Market Advisors, free live webinar, The Economics of Sports Betting. And catch this, an honest view of the operations and profitability of a sports book. And this webinar is being held at this very moment. Much has been said about the promise of regulated sports betting at the state level, with various estimates citing huge potential, so without reading more, uh, the future is clear. With the allowing of sports betting at state level, the incidence of problem gambling is certainly going to, it's, it's going to explode. Like any activity, the more accessible and the more available, the, the, the more people will become involved in that activity. More people that are involved raises the number of people that, that have problems with that. Whether it's skiing, whether it's gambling, whether it's opening some new bars or liquor stores in town. So that's what's right around the corner. screening and we're going to talk about the opportunities for some state support from the Office of Behavioral Health. The odds are very good that you know someone with a gambling problem. The odds are also very good that you don't know they have a gambling problem. And we're going to talk about that a little bit as well. So next slide. So I'm wondering, have any of you worked with clients with gambling disorders or their their family members? Good. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, 
Good. A number of you uh, have had some experience with this. Uh, of those of you in, I need to back up. Those of you, how many of you are in the mental health field, counseling, almost most people in it? Those of you that have not worked with people with gambling disorders, how many of you regularly screen for gambling disorders? How many of you that have not worked with problem gamblers or gambling disorders or have worked with gambling disorders regularly screen for gambling disorders? Okay, out of all the people in here, Working mental health. We have two, and, and that's actually higher than most groups. So you're to be congratulated as a group for having uh, even two. It, it just isn't done, and that's what we're going to talk about today. And that's what your workshop is going to focus on. The difficulty in bringing up that conversation is generally that you have never brought up that conversation before. And it's never easy to do something the first time. So the workshop today, which I'm jumping ahead of myself, the workshop today will allow some practice in making this discussion a normal part of your conversation. And we've learned some things about screening. And frankly, I was very surprised. And we'll touch on that in a second. Uh, we're also going to talk a little bit about terminology. Uh, this is an excellent publication. It comes out every couple of years. It's put together by a group, we can back up a little, it's put together by a group that's sometimes referred to as asparagus, and then another group, the National Council on Problem Gambling. The Association of Problem Gambling Service Administrators is the group of those from each state that oversee and manage gambling programs, funding, logistics in that state. There's a survey done every couple of years to get a sense of what does the universe of gambling counseling look like in our country right now. And so this publication is really informative. And we're going to take a look at what does it look like in the United States, and we're going to look at what does it look like in Colorado, and how do we fit screening into all of this. So you'll notice here, in terms of terminology, problem gambling was used four times on that cover. Um, there's a lot of different terms that are used to describe gambling problems. We have at risk, we have compulsive, we have pathological, we have gambling disorders. We, it, the purposes of our discussion we're probably just going to talk about problem gambling, uh, knowing that there's different degrees of severity. Technically, with the DSM-5, we have gambling disorders. So I, I want, most people are still talking about, they use the term problem gambling. So if we can, don't we need to back up a little? Okay, let's take a look nationally at what's going on. With substance use disorders, we have about 20.8 million. And that's about 8% of the population. With gambling disorders, we have 5.45 million. So we have four times as many people with substance use disorders. And the relative size, you can see from the area of the circle. So how much funding is dedicated to this problem? Well, with substance use disorders, we have 24.4 billion. With gambling, we have 73 million. So the amount of money devoted to gambling, and alleviation of gambling problems, is 334 times smaller. And I think what I really want to point out is with substance use disorders, 
we have $14.7 billion coming from the federal government. How much do we have coming from the federal government for gambling? Zero. That's unacceptable. There's been a huge push from National Council on Problem Gambling, working with various representatives and senators to change that condition. The federal government, how do they make money on gambling? If you win the lottery, is that part of your income? Does it need to be declared? Are you taxed, federal tax? There's millions of dollars that are going to the federal government just through income tax. Not one red cent is returned to the states to take care of the devastation that accompanies any kind of high risk behavior. I'm not selling some thing. I'm not picking on gambling. Uh, skiing, we have casualties. Any, any kind of behavior has an amount of risk associated with it. With that risk, generally those that profit also help with the costs of that behavior. And the part of the federal government and gambling, that has not yet happened. So as community activists and those in the know about gambling, make your voices heard. Okay, so that's what's going on nationally. At Colorado, estimated 2.4%, over 100,000 people in the state are believed to manifest a gambling problem. And as Larry mentioned, in 2016, there was 1.4 billion spent on legalized gambling. Of that amount, the state collected almost 240 million in revenue. And how much of that 240 million is returned in the form of services to those people that are having problems with their gambling, the communities that are having problems, or, or the families. Uh, we'll see here. Uh, if, if you want to check the resources on that, the numbers came from here. So the next slide. So of that 239 million, the amount allocated to the gambling impact fund, and I'm not going to go into detail about how all the revenue is split up, but there is a fund that is supposed to address problems that have arisen as a result of legalizing gambling in Colorado. For the most part, those funds are restricted to the counties in which casinos exist or the adjoining counties. A number of years ago, Rob Gavin Coalition Colorado, I was on the advisory board at that time and I remember appearing before the state legislature to petition that part of that gambling impact money, rather than going to paving roads and painting porches of county commissioners in the states and in the counties in which casinos exist, that part of that funding should be devoted to working with people with gambling problems. The legislature agreed, money was set aside, and currently, and Mary can correct me if I have any of my numbers wrong, Mary is manager of clinical training, workforce development, and oversees the, the gambling funding in the state. About 269,000 out of that 239 million goes to the gambling impact fund. The Office of Behavioral Health has access to almost 150,000 of that. The amount out of that 150 that was spent last year is 81,000. And this is what we're going to be talking about at the end of my session, is what is that money used for? The money's used to help you work with indigent clients, number one, so it provides funds for treatment. It also provides funds for you to advance your training and credentialing uh, through pursuing national certification. Okay, and we'll talk a little bit about that. So, the next slide. Uh, 
regarding Colorado and its support of problem gambling or gambling disorder services. Can you find Colorado? It's at, oops, oh, this work. Way down there, way to the right end of the tail. So of the 40 states that specifically funded problem gambling services, 40 of the 50 do fund problem gambling services. Of those 40, Colorado ranked 37. Now if you count all 50 states, the average amount per capita that was devoted to working with gambling disorders was 23 cents. If you count only the 40, of the 40 that did provide some kind of government funding, we were 37th out of 40. So we're thankful for the money and the resources that were provided from the state. And at the same time, we are certainly hoping for a lot more. In particular, with uh, sports betting at the state level, just around the corner. So, PG, why do people need training in PG from gambling or gambling disorders? It's referred to, how many of you have heard that it's referred to as the hidden addiction? Yeah. Okay. Um, now, how many have heard of it as the hidden addiction? <laughs> and now you should all raise your hands if you just heard it. Okay. Let's see if you're paying attention. Okay. There may be very few obvious signs. It may be that your partner, your friend, your family member, your spouse is acting a little strange. They're whispering on the phone. They're, uh, you know it appears something's going on. And it's an affair, isn't it? Because there's this secretiveness. There's this unwillingness to disclose. There's facts that don't match up. And so very often, partner, friend, family member, well, their first thought is there's some kind of uh, illicit relationship. Well, this illicit relationship is with gambling. So with other addictions, we very often have overtly, catastrophically visible signs. We have automobile accidents, we have infectious diseases, we have hangovers, we have bodily injury. With gambling, uh, it can often be hidden. There's an elusive satiation point. When we look at other addictions, how much can you drink? Can you drink five bottles of scotch? No, you're going to pass out. Can you have 40 orgasms in a day? No, there's a point of satiation. So with substances, even other behavioral addictions, there is generally a point of satiation. With gambling, there for some people, there seems to be no point of satiation. The point of satiation, obviously, is you finally have no more money, but that's where the uh, gambling disorder client excels, and that's finding money when there is no more, okay? Because of this, the financial devastation that a person can honestly admit to themselves at some point they will never recover from losing this 250000 They will never recover from blowing all of their children's college funds. They will never recover financially from the position they have put themselves in unless they keep him. So it gets worse, it gets worse. This leads to feelings of hopelessness. There's winning first, and then there's losing, and there's desperation, four stage hopelessness. Hopelessness feeds into feelings of despair and suicide. Sometimes that suicide is intentional. Sometimes that suicide is to drive into a tree or off a cliff so the family can collect the insurance money because it's too late to save your family financially any other way than that insurance policy. So suicide rate among problem gamblers 
is higher than any other addictive disorder and perhaps any other psychiatric disorder. The financial crimes, as Larry mentioned, if you're a coke addict, it's expensive, but you'll make the money. You can prostitute yourself or, or you can become a dealer or you can, there's a number of ways that you're not going to be financially devastated like with problem gambling. So problem gambling often leads to financial crimes. In fact, 66% of people with gambling disorders have involved themselves in illegal activity to support their gambling behavior. Interestingly, the DSM-5 has nine criteria for problem gambling. The DSM-4 has 10. But when they made the new one, they took out illegal behavior. Um, it generated a lot of discussion. There are reasons why they, they did do it. There's other people have reasons why they should have left it in. Even though it is not in the DSM-5, it's an important thing to know when working with um, disordered gambling is the financial crimes, fair disclosure, debt collection. Very often when you're at the end of your rope, you're getting loans, but you're getting loans at 100% interest from a loan shark, that 100% interest is every month, right? So you're quickly in so deep that this leads to despair. We had a case a few years ago. There was an illegal poker club right over here on Broadway, a little bit north. There were two suicides. And um, I got sort of involved in it. Channel 9 was, or Channel 7, was doing an expose and came over and we met and talked about it and what had happened was the illegal poker club conveniently had a loan sharking business in the back room. Two gentlemen that were frequent customers got in so deep that the collectors, Bruno, with whom did they carry forearms and the hood over his head, Bruno intimidated two of the problem gamblers that were deeply in debt to the point where they suicided. This gets really crazy. Okay? This is serious business. So the financial crimes, the fear of disclosure, clients know that they're supposed to be honest with their consumer. They also know that if someone finds out about the embezzlement, about the credit card fraud, that they're going to go to prison. This puts them in a no-win situation. They can't be good clients if they're hiding things from you, but they can't disclose because they don't know that they can really trust you. So this again makes it different than other addictive disorders. So with these things and other things, problem gamblers are very reluctant to freely disclose. And finally, and I think this is one of the biggest things. There is only one way to recover financially. When you're $250,000 in debt, or for some people $70,000 in debt, or for some people $28,000 in debt, there is only one way you're ever going to recover financially from that debt, and that is to continue to gamble. There is no other addiction. An alcoholic can't say, this whiskey is killing me. The only thing that's going to make me better is if I drink more. There's no other addiction where you can truthfully say, the only way out of this mess totally is to continue to do it. With gambling, that in fact is true. If you win mega millions, your problem is solved. Well, at least in your mind. Of course, then you're going to go... You're on the winning streets so here, and we've got that, of course. But the incentive to continue the behavior is so strong because this is your way out of the financial hole you've dug yourself into. And this is different than other addictions. So these are some of the things that make problem gambling unique. And I'm going to check the time. I have. I have a half hour? Like 45 or 50 minutes. I have 45 or 50 minutes? Okay. So let's talk about the need for screening. 
And then we're going to talk a little bit about Colorado gambling grants. So terminology again. When you're in the field, we want to be respectful. We want to use the right kind of words, the right kind of language. We want person first language when we talk about clients, all of that. But it is still very common to talk about problem gambling. Now, the DSM-4, technically, was pathological gambling. DSM-5, we talk about gambling, people with gambling disorders. <coughs> DSM-4, we had 10 criteria, as I mentioned. DSM-5, we got rid of illegal activity associated with the behavior. We also use terms like compulsive gambling. In fact, when they put the initial gambling in the DSM, many people recovering from the disorder strongly preferred compulsive. They did not want pathological. They did not want to be considered victims of some pathology. They were okay with, yeah, I kind of compulsively keep doing it. So there were huge debates around that. We have problem gambling, we have at-risk gambling, we have responsible gambling, we have professional gambling, we have social gambling. Um, in this session, we're pretty much just going to talk about problem gambling with different levels of severity. Mild, moderate, severe. Okay. So, PG screening. Why screen? Well, Keith White, Executive Director of the National Council, when Paul Gambling last month said gambling disorders, we must identify these in people that are not freely disclosing this. And many do not freely disclose disclose this. And we're going to see a couple of research studies that are, are really mind-boggling in a way about how few people will voluntarily disclose their gambling uh, challenges. Gambling disorders are all pervasive. They lead to financial, emotional, social, occupational, and physical harm. Gambling disorders affect about 1% of the general population. And that would be maybe at uh, the severe, moderate, severe, subclinical, another two to three percent. The numbers vary on where you do the research, what, you know, how randomly you sample, things like that. Uh, generally, we're looking at one, two, sometimes three percent of the general population in certain areas have severe forms. Uh, two to three times that many with, with mild or moderate. Then we get into adolescents, and their numbers are three to five times higher. Does that surprise any of you? Okay. A lot of people are surprised. You think, wow, how, how do kids get that uh, over-involved in gambling? Um, a way of having it not surprise you is what about drinking among 16 to 18 year olds? Are levels of drinking more elevated in that age group than they are maybe in the 30, 30? Yes. Uh, it's not uncommon for that age group to over involve themselves in lots of activities. So gambling is right in there with the rest of them. In research looking at primary care, uh, as many as 10% of the patients report lifetime of problem gambling, lifetime history, they occurred sometime in their life. And an additional 5% is subclinical, uh, meaning they have some problems. We would consider them to fall into that category of at risk. There are some problems, their, their world isn't collapsing yet, if they continue, things could get worse, or the level at which things are bad now can, can build up. So these are people we're concerned with. The research shows people with gambling-related problems are more likely to smoke, are more likely to consume excessive amounts of caffeine, they have more emergency department visits, more likely to be obese, and as we'll also see, they're much more likely to be involved in substance use disorders. 
Many cases of problem gambling go undetected due to limited assessment for this problem and the stigma associated with this. A lot of people are embarrassed. They're, with a drug, you can say, well, this is an addicting drug. It has not, it's not about me. It's about the pharmacological properties of, of opiates. But gambling people sometimes will be a little bit more embarrassed because they can't point to the, char the pharmacological characteristics of the behavior. So they're more reluctant. Uh, the DSM-5 recognizes this challenge. And in the 2013 publication DSM-5, fewer than 10% of people with gambling disorders actually seek treatment. SAMHSA, same thing. They have stated screening for PG is very important because few seek treatment directly for gambling disorders. Rather, they'll seek treatment for related problems. Maybe the depression or the panic or the fear or the desperation, the family chaos, disharmony, the things that are associated or, or a result of the problem gambling. But we will also see that most clinical conditions precede. When we talk about depression, anxiety, substance use disorders, three fourths of the time these disorders precede the problem gambling. But in any event, uh, the American Psychiatric Association, Substance Abuse Mental Health Service Administration, everyone is acutely aware of how few people present for help with problem gambling. One study done by Kessler published in 2008, we got the U.S. National Comorbidity Study, and this is a face-to-face -face household survey. Uh, over 9,000 clients or people, citizens, were involved in this study, and close to 80% reported gambling in their lives. 2.3% reported that they had experienced problems, mostly serious problems, with their gambling, and that currently, 0.6%. Uh, Most estimates are more like 1%, 1 to 2%. So this is a little low, but be that as it may. Of that 9,282, almost half were treated at some time for a mental disorder. And in this case, I don't think we're talking personality disorders, we're talking mental syndromes, anxiety, depression, substance use disorder. Half of them have presented with uh, behavioral mental health disorders for treatment. Not one of them ever received treatment for gambling problems. So if you take 2.3 percent, multiply it by 9,282, I came up with 213. So this to me is totally unacceptable. How, how do we defend that we have that number of people suffering problems this severe that are actually in mental health facilities talking to licensed credential counselors and not one of them talked about their gambling. Not one of them apparently was screened for gambling. Not one of them had a counselor that was willing to engage in that conversation, which is not hard to understand. Until you have done it, it's easier to wait and do it the next time. Uh, evaluation of brief screens. Seth Heimelhock publication from 2015. And there are two sets of data that I think you'll find interesting associated with Seth's research in, in his uh, research team. Uh, the 300 subjects that he was looking at, that he was working with, 23.66% were in intensive outpatient at an addiction treatment facility. 
the remaining 76.34% were attending methadone maintenance. And administering the, the DSM, it was determined that 40% of those 300 clients met the criteria for gaming disorder. So in this particular substance using population, close to half met the criteria for gambling disorder. And almost 80% of that half were moderate and severe. So when we talk about the overlap between substance use disorders and gambling, uh, different pieces of research vary on the numbers but we know it's huge. Okay, along with this, there's some curiosity about screening. So these 300 subjects, clients, were administered these screening instruments, and these will be the four that we focus on today. There are certainly more, the Canadian one, and SOGS, and a number of others. But these are four that are commonly used and representative, and they give everyone an idea of how a short screen can be useful and the things we want to look for. Uh, the conclusion was all four of them actually did do a good job. So they first looked at 300, and with the DSM, determined who met the DSM criteria and whether they were mild, moderate, or severe. Then they had them fill out these instruments, and all four were very powerful. Uh, the BBGS, Free Class Social uh, Gambling Screen, did a little better. Why you would use one over the other probably has to do with personal preference. It may have to do with particular clinical characteristics of the clients that you work with. And we're going to take a look at all four of these and the things that are looked at with each of these four. Also, another reason to screen mood, anxiety, substance use disorders precede in three quarters of cases. These clinical conditions will occur prior to the person developing a gambling disorder. So if we get a handle on this, while the gambling problems are developing, we're able to jump in and prevent the gambling disorder. But only if we ask, only if we make this a part of the discussion. Okay, so, I'm willing to screen now. Convince me, Farragher. How do we do it? Um, we have some longer screens and we have some shorter screens. Depending on the characteristics of your treatment center, your private practice, you may prefer one over the other. I'm going to jump to a conclusion here. And um, unfortunately, the most current research suggests that simply giving someone a form or asking them 10 questions or nine with the DSM-5 or 20 for the, the, um, the GA or um, 17 for the NODS, the, the results are not very reliable. People are much better at saying no than they are at saying yes. So if you use a longer form, a longer screen, you're going to have to figure out a way to integrate these questions into the conversation. And again, jumping to the end, it, it's okay to give someone a questionnaire. The lie bet. Have you ever had to lie about your senator gambling? Have you ever needed found yourself betting more than you intended? You can hand that to someone they can check yes, no, yes, no. Um, but you may not get an answer that reflects reality. So if you're using instruments with 17 questions, 10 questions, 20 questions, uh, you're actually going to want to be integrating the questions 
into a conversation you're having. That's why we're going to move towards shorter screens. Now, some of the more popular longer screens, and certainly they can be part of the intake package that you give people. Sometimes people fill out the intake package at home before they show up for the first visit. Sometimes they come to the clinic a half hour early to do the intake. But however you want it done, um, these screens are uh, public domain. All of them are accessible for free on the internet. Mary brought copies of many of these instruments that you can find out during over break. The sound of the ox has been around the longest, 16 questions, some with multiple parts. The NORC, National Opinion Research Center of the University of Chicago, Diagnostic Statistical Manual Screen for Gambling Problems, called the NODS. 17 questions, some of them, you only score 10 of the 17. Some of them are combined, there'll be three. And even if you say yes, call three, you only get one point. Uh, Gallers Anonymous 20 questions is good. Uh, a great innovation is the NODS self-administered. And I've seen that online many places. So people can take the NODS essay online and their score will be reported to them in a confidential way. And then we have the DSM-5, nine criteria. So all of these are up there, nine, 16, 17 questions. We may not need an advantage of a longer screen because when people do answer affirmatively to an item, that gives you information about their gambling behavior. So beyond simply finding a slot for mild, moderate, severe, you also receive information about their particular situation. So the, the DSM-5, um, here it is, nine criteria. Pay attention here. It's like 20 minutes, is that? 25. 25? Okay. Um, these are the things we look for. No matter what screen you're using, no matter what kind of discussion, these are things that we see in the lives of people with disordered gambling. We see an increase in the amount of money or the frequency. There's some increase in frequency, amount, duration, magnitude, or a decrease in latency. Person's restless or irritable when they're trying to cut down. They've made repeated unsuccessful efforts to cut down or control. Often preoccupied. They may not be gambling, but they're trying, how the hell am I going to cover that check I wrote last night? Where am I going to get some money to pay Joe before he comes over and repossesses the furniture? This is 24 7. People are totally consumed with how to get money, where to gamble, how to hide it, how to cover up that last lie. Often gamble from feeling distress. Like other addictions, uh, uh, gambling is in many cases a way of managing feelings and moods. After losing money, often return another day to get even, referred to as chasing, and the DSM this is one of the things that makes it a little different than other addictions. We don't see chasing with gambling, we do. We see some pretty crazy behavior with chasing. People get down on their luck, they're deeply in debt, they don't know how to cover these bad checks they wrote. And, and rather than betting on odds that give them 50-50 you know, or 49 61, now they're betting 1,000 to 1 because they have a lot of money going back and they want to do it quickly. So the spiral down accelerates rapidly when people start chasing. Lie to conceal the extent, jeopardize or lost significant relationship, uh, relies on others to provide money. 
So all of these things are important. What we want to do with a brief screen, and a lot of research has gone into, if we're not going to ask nine questions, if we're going to ask two, three, or four, what are the two, three, or four that we want to bring up in the conversation? And so that's how we get from the longer screens to brief screens, is try to identify, and there's been a lot of research going into which are the best predictors. So we also have uh, the NODS and the NODS SA, where we have 10 questions with the DSM-5, we have nine things to look at, here we have 10. So the shorter screens, the brief biosocial gambling screen, and three of them, we're going to look at the items for each of these four. The NODS CLIP has three items, the NODS PERC has four items, the LIBET has two items. So the brief biosocial gambling screen is a three item survey. During the last 12 months, during the last 12 months, during the last 12 months. So what are they looking at? Have you become Restless, irritable, anxious. So we're looking at withdrawal. Research has shown that's an important and, and very common condition associated with problem gambling. Is that feeling of pumping all those things together under withdrawal? Have you tried to keep your family from knowing this is lying? Okay, and that's one of the DSM criteria as well. But lying. Keeping it a secret, confabulating, exaggerating, making things up is very common for problem gambling. And finally, did you need bailouts or help? Or one month. Did things get so bad that you had to borrow some money to give to your children for their lunch? Uh, any number of things that you needed to borrow money for. So that's the PPGS. Those are the three items that are sampled with the PPGS. The NADS clip. They were trying to cut down, stop control. So this is the loss of control. It's very common. Now, as we go through these four, think about which things you would be comfortable or prefer to bring up in your conversation when you're doing intake and assessment during the first couple sessions, okay? And it may be that the best items for you are the ones you're most comfortable with. Just don't pick two. A couple of these have lying. Um, so, you know, pick different items. But think about your client population. Think about the things you really groove on when you're talking. And these may be the items then that you'll want to introduce in your open-ended, motivational, interviewing, inspired way of interacting with your client when you first meet them. Finally, the third here, are the periods two weeks or longer where you think a lot about the gambling, gambling experience, planning out futures, so preoccupation. We have the nods perk, I think, is next. Uh, and the clip, the eye is supposed to be little, but my PowerPoint in that position on the PowerPoint makes me use all caps. It should be C L small I P. And we have um, Mary brought many of these instruments. So back to the perk. There have been periods two weeks or longer. Okay, so they're preoccupation again. Have you ever gambled as a way to escape? Okay. Is there a period if you lost a lot of money, so we have chasing again? Has this caused serious or repeated problems in relationships with family or friends? So these are the four items that the NADS perk has identified as being very useful predictors of problem gambling. And live at scale, finally. Uh, 
Uh, Rena Nora at the end was my clinical supervisor years. And Rena uh, passed away. She was a physician at Veterans Administration Hospital and one of the foremost. Um, Peggy has been in the field a long time, knows how far back uh, Rena. Well, I had the good fortune of having her as my clinical supervisor when I got credential. But uh, the live vet scale, two items. Line and increased bedding data. The challenge we have found, and Lori Brugel, as uh, Larry mentioned, um, has done a lot of work in problem gambling, gambling screening, et cetera, et cetera. She has a wonderful PowerPoint, much better than mine, on screening that's accessible at the NADAC website, National Association of Addiction Professionals website. Screens, when we do research and we ask for volunteers from either clinical uh, populations or maybe our graduate students, or whatever, the screens seem to do a pretty good job. It was discovered through repeated testing, they don't do such a good job in real life. So don't feel confident that when you give someone a nice clip, a nice perk, ask them to like that, and they say no, 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 that there's no meat there. Um, we found that people are pretty good at just dismissing the question. So what do we do? If these things don't work, well, we can still administer them. They can still be part of the intake passage. But we need to bring this up in the conversation. So you can select questions from these screens because we know they're valid. There's been a lot of research done on all of these screens. And again, so your clinical intuition, the nature of your client population, the things you're comfortable with may direct you towards one question versus some of the others. Integrate this into a normal conversation. The other thing is when, when you bring up gambling and say, gee, you know, I want to thank you. You've shared so much with me. I've learned so much about you and I appreciate how much you're here. And I'm, I'm curious, what do you do for fun? You've had a tough time. What kinds of recreation? Some people, you know, like dinner parties, some people like to go to movies, some people like gambling. And by gambling, I mean, so you don't just throw out gambling. You give examples. For instance, in the casino, we're playing bingo, we're betting on sports. And I say especially golf, because there's this guy I golf with. There is nothing he doesn't want to bet on. You know, I say, oh, damn, I hit it in the trap. Bet your fuck you didn't. <laughs> you don't know what it is. Okay. We end up kind of even every week, so I don't care. But, uh, and of all, we get back to sports betting, just for your information. What sport is most represented in gambling disorder? Fancy. Look at all the college sports, the professional sports. Uh, think Phil Mickelson, think John Daly, think... Yeah. Yeah, why would it be golf? When you're on a high school college golf team, do all four of you golf at the same time? Do all four of you depend on the other person to, to pass to you, to block for you? Golf is individual, even if you're on a golf team. You don't give a damn about your team members. There's only one winner, and the winner is you, not your university. On the PGA Tour, there's only one winner, and that's you, not your, your golf team. So there's some characteristics of golfers that make them different than those that play team sports. You might say that about a few other sports, like skiing. But anyway, to keep going, you, you mentioned different activities that may give someone kind of a wake-up call and normalize it for them. It may be an aha 
What do you mean, lottery is gambling? No, that's, you know, scratch tickets aren't gambling. I always would at least rebut that. That's, okay? Now, while you're meeting your client the first week or two, and you're putting together cognitive case conceptualization of what this is, where does gambling fit in, be aware of stages of change. How many of you have not heard of stages of change? So, you know what I mean now. You don't want to be in the wrong place. Uh, here in this building for years, I was the director of the Problem Gambling Treatment and Research Center in the clinic right down the hall. When people call to get an appointment with me at the Problem Gambling Treatment and Research Center, how many of them are in pre-contemplation? None. If you had any thought you had a camera room, why would you call? Okay? So the people we're going to be screening for, though, are going to be in pre-contemplation or maybe contemplation. Okay, so pay attention to where your clients have in terms of how you bring up these screening questions. If you're way back here down in pre-contemplation, trying to invite them to think about some incongruencies in, in their life and how they're behaving, and they want a plan. They're not coming back. If you're not where they're at, they won't be back. So we're going to go from here. Counselors, healthcare providers need specific training. You have to understand it's not your job to catch or judge. And I think I'm going to have to speed things up a little. Um, how many of you are not familiar with motivation interview? How many of you have had some kind of training or exposure to motivation interview? Great, because this is the training you need. So we're not going to spend a lot of time on, on, on this. Uh, we're eliciting curiosity in this conversation. We're having, I'm wondering if, can you tell me more about? We have all the MI stuff, and, and which reminds me, uh, I apologize, but when we scheduled this conference, <coughs> I was unaware that they were also going to schedule my first class of spring quarter at 11.30. So I'm not going to be around after break. I will be up in room 202 teaching motivational interview. So, uh, respect, autonomy, curiosity, non-judgment. That's all motivational interview. The skills. How many of you have never heard of fours? Go ahead. Open-ended questions, affirmations, reflections, summaries, and then addition three of the book, added information and advice, when appropriate. This is how we talk to people about their gambling. Um, there's a little, I think we're going to be posting these PowerPoints. This is kind of a good little um, example of someone a uh, dorm counselor bringing up problem gambling with one of the residents at the dorm. Uh, it doesn't turn out so good. <laughs> you know, I thought after seven minutes, the client was going to go, yeah, I'm going to schedule an appointment at the end of seven minutes, the client, you know, if I can't wait to get to the racetrack. So it doesn't end well, but it's still done well. <laughs> so at the end of this presentation, in a workshop, I would do something like this. Get into groups of two or three, says the client, there's a clinician, there's an observer, and practice doing, practice initiating the conversation so that you have done it once. It was so much easier to do it in your clinical practice after you've done it once, you've had it done to you once, and it's no longer something new, fresh out of the box. And anything like, hey, thanks for coming in. You've shared much about yourself. Wondered if we could talk about it. Uh, gambling could include. Okay? So, get away from the idea that all you have to do is hand out the perk or the nods or the SOGs or, and figure out how you're going to integrate this into your conversation in a very respectful, MI kind of way. 
So that takes care of screening. And I'm going to invite Mary up here. She had agreed to come up here as I briefly go over, I think we have 10 minutes, 9 minutes. And um, thank you. Mary has reviewed a number of these. and. All right, hello again, and thank you, Dr. Greiner. That's um, certainly been a great refresher on the importance of using screening for gambling. Um, I think it's one thing that we take away with us today for sure is to really increase those screens and, and start identifying this population that certainly has been underserved here in Colorado. Um, so I'm with the Office of Behavioral Health. As I mentioned earlier, I just wanted to um, talk briefly about the gambling grants that we have available. There's flyers out on the table, so you um, are certainly welcome to grab one of those. I'm very excited to see that we do have a few um, recipients of the grants here in the audience today, so um, I'm really happy to see that. So one of the things that OBH has for individual counselors or clinicians that are working towards becoming nationally certified as a pro for problem gambling, um, we do have money that will help, help pay for half of all the expenses to become um, nationally certified. So your training, the 30 or 60 hours, um, OBH will pay for half of that. Your supervision hours that are required will pay for half of those. The test will pay for. Um, and then um, there's one other thing, getting, getting, get, getting the actual license. <laughs> well, there you go. Um, so we, we will cover all of that. Um, the process is pretty simple. There's an application on the OBH website that you can um, fill out and send directly back to me. And um, if you do pick up one of these flyers, my email address is on the bottom of that. So please reach out to me directly and I can um, get you all that information. The other monies that we have available for the grants is for um, clinicians who are working with individuals um, with problem gambling that are indigent clients. So if they don't have third party payer or any other type of insurance and do not have Medicaid, then this grant money will um, come into effect and be your agency or you as the clinician will be eligible to use that to work with these individuals. So we do have this money available. Um, very excited about it. Um, as Dr. Ferrer has talked about, like we really want to increase the awareness. We want to increase the screens. We want to increase um, reaching out to these individuals to get them the, the services that we have available. Um, and then the um, crisis line, certainly, um, I would start putting that on all of your um, stuff, letting people be aware of that crisis line so that individuals are aware of a number that they can call. Um, so we do cover with this grant, working with individuals, um, families. We do cover working with um, teens, elderly, all of that. So it does encompass every, um, every individual that is affected by this. So um, please, if you're, if you're interested, reach out to me and let me know that. Any questions? Sorry. Any questions? Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you so much, Claire. Um, so I'm going to briefly jump through the different levels of certification are, do some work solid acronym stuff so it won't be Greek to you when you get online. There are two levels of certification, except for that there's really three or maybe four, depending on how you count them. But at the basic consular level, there's International Certified Gambling Consular Level 1, and there's International Gambling Consular Level 2. For the 1, you need four hours of clinical case consultation. And at the National Council of Problem Gambling and, and the International Council of Certification, the term consultation is used rather than supervision. I'm not going to say they're the same because the reason for using a different word is that they're not the same, although if you were looking at both, it would be hard to tell the difference. But So when we use the term consultation here, picture communicating, talking about clients, talking about the kinds of things that you might talk about with a supervisor. The hours of training you need, and this can be accessed different places, Mary can probably help you with that. There's also uh, National Council on Problem Gambling 
website, and I have the link here, will tell you who is doing some trainings, who's doing some workshops. For the level two, there's a pretty big difference between level one and two. But level two, we're looking at 24 hours of clinical case consultation, and the training is 60 hours rather than 30. This is at the national level. So the next slide. Another designation is the Board Approved Clinical Consultant, the BACC. Um, and that's one of the credentials I earned years ago. So your supervision must be provided with someone that is recognized by the National Council on Problem Gathering as the board approved clinical consultant. Um, I left my card out on the table if there's anyone interested. And in, 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 I think there's uh, Nancy Lance in Colorado. There's only two board approved clinical consultants in Colorado, and I believe there's only 60 national. Uh, but if you go to the National Council on Problem Gathering webpage, you can track down, you might be able to arrange something free with, you know, Dr. Nora down in Nevada. Um, she's been given a grant to provide the, the consultation at no charge. In any event, um, that's what the BACC refers to. Then there's a new specialist. The IGCCD International Co-Occurring Gambling Specialist Certificate for people who work in substance abuse, substance use disorder programs that also want to get credentialing, training, supervision, and experience working with uh, gambling disorders. And then Mary, again, the grant program is wonderful. Um, some of this will be posting, I think, Mary, are we going to be posting the PowerPoints on PGCC website and so you'll be able to track down some of the information and then go through here. Quickly, much of it is on the handouts that you'll be able to get at the front table. Money from the Gambling Impact Fund was freed up in 2008. And again, what Mary was talking about, there's funding for treatment and there's funding for education. And that includes coursework as well as paying for the supervision slash consultation. A little bit about the treatment. Jump forward. Training. So here's what you need. Bachelor's degree in the behavioral health field. And you need to submit, and I should repeat this twice on the slide. Gambling specific training and education plan. Where have you made arrangements to get training? What are the days when you get supervision? What's your plan in order to get the, the scholarship support? You need 50 hours for the ICG-1, 1,000 for the two. You need to identify the supervisor consultation BACC. And again, you need four hours for the one, 24 for the two. And you need to be a certified addiction counselor, Colorado. CAC 2, 3, or LAC. So, in brief, you submit a certification plan. So you have a clinical consultation. Make sure that this person is board approved from National Council of Problem Gambling and that you have evidence, uh, proof of that. And four hours in the 30 and the 60 and this is pretty much it so that's the end okay. thank you any questions comments about thank you
the question is what? Um, what type of gambling or team sport would those be involved? Scratch tickets are big. They're so available, they're so accessible. When you get into casino kinds of things. Can um, you use the microphone, Mike? Oh, yes, yeah. thank you. Uh, scratch tickets in most states, uh, lottery, they're big because they're so available. They're in grocery stores, they're in 7 Elevens, they're, they're easy. And so those are big sellers. When, when we get into established businesses, casinos, um, uh, slot machines and video poker are very big. So that's the most problem. That maybe changes a little bit regionally. It changes some places like Alaska gambling is not illegal, but it's, it's hard to find. How many states do not allow gambling? Two. You got it. Which two? Yeah, Hawaii and Utah. And I always think it's kind of funny. Utah and Nevada are the opposites. Nevada, you could do anything you want. In Utah, you can't do anything you want. So, but there, there are two, Hawaii and Utah, are the only states in, in which there is no legal form of gambling. Does that answer your question? She's asking about adolescents. What's the most popular for adolescents? Uh, the video poker was huge. Um, remember about 10 years ago when Texas Hold'em? Y'all remember that? Not video poker, but poker is, is huge. Cards, sports betting is huge among male. Um, typically in adolescence, the rate of male gamblers is much higher than female. As we get up into the late 20s and 30s, we're seeing more of an even balance. But among adolescents, gambling much more frequent among males. And there's a lot of the sports betting. There's a lot of betting on arm wrestling. There's a lot of that kind of stuff going on with adolescents. Um, and again, we go back to, we saw a huge increase when Texas Hold'em became so famous. You all remember that? There were five networks, at least, that showed uh, gambling on television. How many have heard of the World Series of Poker? Yeah. Okay, this is insane. Think of heck, have you ever heard of the World Series of Chugging Tequila? Or the, the World Series of Binge Eating? Or the, and yet we had five networks glorifying and the, when, when the Texas Hold'em thing came up. So we saw a huge spike in that. Yes? Is there any research or is there a lot of research on online gambling? Or can you talk about online gambling a little bit? Um, it, it's, it's huge. The online thing was sex addiction and gambling. We saw huge spikes in the frequency, prevalence, incidence of people experiencing problems. It used to take effort. You'd have to at least get out of your bathroom to gamble. Or um, but with the internet and instant availability of, of sex and shopping and gambling. Uh, so the online thing uh, is there. Th there were attempts to regulate that by making it illegal for financial institutions in the United States to complete financial transactions that had to do with gambling. So everything just got moved to the Caribbean. As soon as it's offshore, the federal government couldn't regulate it. And that's in particular true of um, a lot of the sports betting, which is why the Supreme Court is pretty much going to throw in the towel. A lot of it has to do with the online. Stuff, even though much of it will be regulated by the states. So that's Pandora's box was opened with that, and no one has successfully figured out a way to close it. Any other? Yes? Yeah, so, um, so I do uh, addiction recovery coaching and intervention work. Mm -hmm. I've been trained through that, but 
when you're talking about the certifications that you can do the national the program that Mary had, was talking about yes um, I, th I thought one of your slides said you had to be CAC certified to apply for it is that right I'm sorry that was at the state level okay I had jumped from and I'm sorry I went through the slides too quickly okay. from the credential requirements nationally right. to get the funding from the state to get the national credentials you need to be CAC2 or above I'm glad you brought that up that's fine. That as well, um, I would hinder that from applying for this grant. Um, we do review those applications on a case-by-case -case basis. So if you have additional education, experience, that sort of thing, um, we certainly look at that because um, we certainly don't want to not or to prevent anyone from being able to apply for this. So please, please do. Yeah, we have money, you. so please do. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I do. Okay. Any other things come to mind before we take our break? Okay, well, thanks again uh, for coming, and I hope some of you have seen before. Let's see you again. A couple things to add for the uh, adolescents. Video games are huge. So when you buy extra skins or different tires for your car for racing, so a lot of adolescents start to put their parents' credit card on their video games, and they're spending hundreds and thousands of dollars to get the latest guns and the latest skins for those guns. That's like, why do you need a little designer gun with a skin on it for 150 or $1,000? And then they auction them off as well. So they'll auction off skins and say, there's only two of these skins available in this game. So now that skin is now not just 150 that you bought it for, it's 500 or 1,000 or 1,500 or $10,000 for kind of those limited edition skins. So, and there's pride in taking responsibility and saying, hey, I have this car that has these things, that there's only uh, limited tires and I have one of those to race. Or I have this for the gun and the different video games and those type of things. So, and so video games and also um, the World Health Organization is looking at the internet addiction. So internet or video gaming kind of addiction, kind of what that looks like and how that, that fits in with gaming or gambling. So, before we went to break, I wanted to quickly just touch on anybody have questions that, you know, you came to the symposium here in the research forum, things that you want to know kind of in the afternoon session. I want everyone leaving here with something meaningful, questions that you have that are unanswered, and to make this actually worth your time. Not that we're just giving you a bunch of information you're like, well, oh, kind of I knew this, or I didn't expect this to be like this. So if you have questions along the way, so we'll take a break, but if you have questions along the way, think about those, let us know. Any streaming tools that you don't have are out front. Um, so we still have some food, orange juice, uh, coffee over there. So let's take a 15 minute break. And also everyone has name badges on, so start networking, talk with others and colleagues that are in the field. So that way we kind of build more of a community around during the disorder. Thanks so much. All right, welcome back. It is 10.45, so we'll kick it off. We have Tammy Pope, who is our expert in gambling disorders in the criminal justice system. So I'll hand the presentation over to her. So I won't be clicking anything or having PowerPoints, just having an open conversation with you guys directly on what I've witnessed and experienced in the years I've been doing this. Um, I had someone asked me earlier how, how many years I've been in the field, and I said, oh, about 20. And then I started counting, 26, because I stopped at my 40th birthday back when, um, counting the years I've been in this profession. Don't know why, just stop at 20. So um, when, you, when you all think of gambling, just collectively, what do you think about, or who, or when, what do you think about? Or who do you envision, or do you envision like a particular game? Yes. I think that the slot machine just like constantly. Digging? Yeah. The noise. Okay. 
Anyone else, when I bring up gambling, do you vision somebody in your family, yourself, um, games, casinos? I just think of like risk taking in general. When I think of gambling, like businessmen jumping out and you know, doing deals or people going to the casinos or scratch tickets or just the whole gamut. That's awesome because a lot of people don't just think about the risk, the risky behaviors they're taking. That's where I fall into too. Awesome. Anybody else? Uh, older folks on fixed incomes going up once or twice a month. Being bust. Yes. Yep. Up in the gambling bus. I've known a lot of people have to. So, has anyone ever thought of, since we think about casinos and slots and um, leaving to go to a facility being bust um, or risky behaviors, has anyone ever really sat down and thought, well, what about the criminal justice system and gambling? Okay. And that's what a lot of people think. We, we don't think about it until we're working in that environment and then we start seeing it and seeing some of the issues it brings about. What about you? I know you said something. Yeah, I work in corrections and I have for about 12 years. And in my mind, yeah, I think about criminal behavior in general as a gamble. Mm -hmm. There's this constant cost-benefit analysis around getting caught. Um, and then also just the thrill-seeking, kind of extroverted um, adrenaline rush thing that they do. Mm -hmm. I think immediately bank robbers and car thieves, huge payoffs, lots of gambling involved. Right. And, and obviously it is about money or what they can gain, but a lot of times, like you said, it's about the rush. It's about being in some kind of group or having something over someone else. Yeah. Absolutely. So that's where I come in, not being narcissistic. <laughs> However, um, the population I work with, um, I've worked in, like I said, prisons, jails, community corrections for 26 years. Um, and so I've seen a range. I've worked half of my professional life in Nebraska, the other half here in Colorado. And um, my, my hope was, I've, I've been a huge advocate um, for individuals with co-occurring disorders. Um, and when I moved to Colorado, I was just like, well, this is gonna be 10 times better, we're gonna have more um, resources, you know, this is gonna be awesome. And I'm coming from the Midwest, you know. No, I, I got here and I'm like, there's less, and there's more people, um, and there's more criminal behavior. And we just need to continue to address that. Um, with that being said, what are some of the things that you've even, that you've seen, heard about, watched on TV even, um, or experienced yourself working there, or being in, you know, an inmate client, um, that people gamble on in jails, prisons, corrections? Yes. Anything. Anything. Cigarettes, candy, mm -hmm. coffee. Mm -hmm. Um, phone time. Right. So, what kind of games do you see? Dice. Okay. And are dice allowed where you're, they're housed? But they're awesome when they make them out of paper and soap, and they're, I mean, they almost look perfect, yeah. right? Where do you see, did you say dice also? Yeah. Okay. I said they bet on the weather. Like they'll oh, yeah. prevent games to bet on. Weather is ideal because nobody can predict that. They will bet on anything. And I'm gonna give you just a little bit of right now on what I've seen. And this is just a little snapshot of what they will bet on. Handball. How many bounces until it hits the wall? Um, two bounces, one bounce, no bounces. They will bet on that. Um, they also used to do, um, when there was the deodorant through commissary or indigent packages, the little ball, the roll-on deodorant. Am I aging myself? Okay. They would remove those and use them as kind of like beer pong, but no beer. Um, and they would bet on how many they can make in the cup. Or whoever makes the most is gonna do this. Um, cards. We have hearts, 
rummy, blackjack, spades. Um, I did see a couple years ago an entire Monopoly board. Um, this person and the cards, this person remembered from playing it before. Uh, set up a whole board and this got many, many of our individuals involved in. And they could bet on not only who won the game, but who got so many houses, who ended up with the most amount of money or property or whatever. So it's just not the outcome of the game. It's every little step in between. Um, they bet on award ceremonies on TV, the, the music awards, the heart awards. Um, there's betting on uh, reality shows. Who's going to get eliminated this week? Um, who's, who, what are the top three that are going to make it to the end? Um, anything like that. Court cases. They will bet on somebody's court cases when they're called out for court and when they return. They'll, they will bet on um, whether it's been, the case has been continued. I told you it was going to get continued again. Um, if their attorney showed, if um, victims or witnesses showed, and they will also bet on what the outcome is. Um, daily events, like you said. A big one that I was really floored over is they will bet on which nurse is going to administer meds. And they're not all assigned to the same pod or the same times, but that's things they will bet on. I bet she comes during this time. Or I bet she does this, we're in one unit, but there's four pods, I bet she does this pod first. Um, and I bet it's Julie that's coming today to do the best. Um, so those are some of the things in weather, like you said. Um, they will just do a uh, bet for the sake of betting. Um, why? I, I think the question is why do people bet um, in jails, prisons, Community corrections, um, some of the reasons, and, and please jump in, feel free to jump in, but some of the reasons is killing time. You can sleep, or you can get up, and you have prisons a little bit more open than jails, but, um, or there's more things to do. But in jail, a lot of times, you're locked in that pod and because of staffing issues or problems within the jail or there's a high profile person that's being transported to court, you have to lock everybody down. Um, there's not much to do. So when they're, we're, when they're in the pod or most of them, that's where a lot of the gambling is, but a lot of times when they're locked in a cell, if you have just one or two roommates, cellmates, that is what you're going to do. It's not that you're going to get on the phone um, or um, do homework assignments. I mean, that does happen. However, a lot of times that's what they have left. And not only will the dice and everything be, um, con it is contraband and it will be hidden, but they will just continue to make it and give up whatever hygiene, food, whatever, so they do have this. Um, it does add excitement. Um, they have something to look forward to. Um, there's a new challenge. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to, I'm gonna go today and I'm gonna gamble and I'm gonna be able to eat this week. A lot of it is survival. Uh, people don't have family or friends that have the money to put on their books or they have isolated themselves from family because of what they, their criminal behaviors and their addiction that they have nobody else. Um, or the third is they owe a large amount of money to the facility on their books. So then now we're breaking another rule by having someone put it on someone else's books and then we're gonna hope it's transferred to the right person because otherwise then we're causing a lot of other problems. So, and I know some of, some of you don't really know what I'm talking about, and I'll kind of explain. So when people have an account at the jail, if they're in the negative, any money that gets put on their books for, for commissary or for hygiene or whatever gets taken 
and those fees get paid. And you have a booking fee, and if you had uh, uh, nursing, you know, if you saw the nurse or doctor, that's a fee. Um, and all that is taken care of way before you get the cheap fee. And a lot of times that's when a lot of problems start because then they put on somebody else's books and that person gets transferred to another pod or, or gets sentenced or transferred or <coughs> kites out and doesn't pay the debt. So that's another problem. Um, some people do it, and I did touch on this bit for survival because they don't have anything or anyone, but some people do it as a business. They really do. Um, you have your, your lead person, your head, um, which runs the table and that keeps the cards and keeps the dice and, and makes sure everything is set up. Um, and then you have, besides doing, uh, having a head person, you have a person that, or people, that run the store. Um, so I knew of somebody that had no commissary, had no anything, and continued to gamble and gamble and gamble. Um, and he would just, would use, you know, things himself, and would just kind of save them, and then wait till people ran out of money and needed coffee or wanted a honey bun, or whatever they wanted, and, and then he would charge them three times as much. And then by that point, he was able to start getting his needs met. However, when he stops winning, um, or when things are confiscated, because there's too many um, items in somebody's property or in their cell, then that becomes a whole other issue. <laughs> so when we're looking at um, jails or prisons, you know, I, I think oftentimes people think, well, I mean, what are they hurting anybody? They have nothing to do anyway. Um, because when it is prohibited, a lot of people just kind of look past it. But I think people don't look at the bigger picture. Um, we're causing, um, or we're allowing people um, to do destructive behaviors that potentially lead to assaults, death, um, anything like that. And I think for people that are even in jail and prison that are in programming, um, whether it's um, TC or substance abuse or mental health, I think that is when you're allowing other behavior, risky behaviors like that, it leads to more criminal behaviors, criminal charges, um, and you're not using your tools that you're learning, you're not thinking first, you're just being impulsive to get your needs met. And I think that oftentimes they're not looking at it from that. And I and in, in in all fairness to you know staff and everything, we're understaffed. And I mean, is it more important to get people seen in court and to get seen by the doctor and to deal with people that um, have overdosed rather than people that are playing a game of money that could or could not end up in a fight. And um, so when people, the potential, I guess, winnings of when they start gambling, because I've had a lot of clients that they're frequent flyers, this is what's expected, this is what they do every time, you know, if they get arrested, just come back like they never left and continue with gambling um, and their regular behaviors. However, I've had plenty of clients that had never gambled a day in their life on anything until they got to jail. And then it got to a point where they were in substance abuse group and therapy and started seeing they attended every group and then all of a sudden, well, he's sick tonight. I said, well, I just walked by and Play cards. Oh, then, and that's where we really catch people. And I hate to use the word catch, but I guess bring it to their attention that there's another issue going on. Um, because this person never missed group and now has missed group twice this week because if they don't win that money back, they're not going to eat. Or their wife has to put money on somebody else's books for their debt. And so now they put everything else aside 
um, educational purposes and treatment purposes to fulfill this new desire. And sometimes it's not, it may not even be the desire to be able it's the desire to actually live and not get assaulted. Um, and I'll tell you a story. Um, a few years ago at one of the jails I was working in, they were doing a gambling um, game cards in the date room. And they were wrapping things up and we, we always have one of the people that stand up and are very angry that they lost and then it turns into somebody cheated or, you know, pulls cards out or, or whatever. Um, but became very angry, started yelling, you know, this is not how we play in prison, this is jail, you know, you guys are messed up. And, you know, people let him just kind of go and there was a few comments made. Well, he went up to his room and got some soup some ramen, top ramen, um, and there was hot water, but only one of the things worked, so he put his in line. Well, one of the new guys um, didn't really know the rules of jail, hadn't been incarcerated before, um, came, came in and didn't know what it was sitting there for, obviously didn't want to touch it, and went and used the hot water head of his. Now, do we know if it's because that was a form of disrespect to the person, or do we think um, he's still angry over the gambling? Either way, this turned into a huge beatdown. Um, the guy was beat up in the day room, dragged off to his cell, left there, um, and ultimately later passed away. This is over a card game that people really didn't think that much of. Now, was it because he disrespected him? Was it because he was angry still that he already had lost and his temper's already, he's already an you know, ang angry person and his temper flared and just snapped, like this is one last thing I can't deal with today? I don't know, but um, this is a problem. And you also have, um, so what they can win, if they win in a game, they can win food, coffee, pop, Soup. We, you know, some places do pop, um, soups, honey buns, um, commissary. A lot of people don't have hygiene, money for hygiene, and um, status is a big one. You're, you know, if you're in the house and you're carrying the cards and the dice, and you're the one that starts the game every day. That's kind of a big deal. Um, same with. Um, people placing bets, so they have that kind of power now that they can tell anybody at any time, I need you to drop and give me 30 push-ups. And if you still want to be in that, that's what you're going to do. Um, again, cash. Uh, not so much in jail transferring, but uh, placed on inmates' books and accounts for, from people outside of the community. Um, how many calls that I've overheard, um, well, I lost today, or football game was horrible, I need you to put 20 books on Jim's account, which is also not allowed, but that's how it kind of spirals, because you're just thinking a friendly, you know, game of handball or whatever, and it turns into this major problem. And then when you get into prisons and stuff, it's, if you have a problem with one person, you have a problem with the whole group, whether it's gang, race, whatever. So it does spiral. Um, what are some of the problems that you can envision or that you've seen when working in a criminal justice system when, although it's the rules, when officers attempt to um, enforce no gambling? For who? Right. But then I'm going to be, I'm going to kind of be the devil's advocate here. If that's the rule, who are we to pick which ones we follow and who follows? Because I know a lot of people are like, I don't care, I don't have time for that. So at least, you know, or like I said, understaffed. Um, but then you're caught with the ones the few, usually the newer, or the 
ones that have been there for a long time, that do try to enforce it, and the backlash shit that happens. So, yeah. I was wondering, do any of the officers ever get involved in I don't know. I don't, not where I see where they sit down and play and bet. However, there's just the talk. You know, you're walking through the day room. And they'll say, no, I bet, I, I'll bet everything that Dallas is going to win tonight, you know. And I'll bet if they lose, I'm not going to take you, I'm not going to transport you guys to group. It's kind of like a joking, but not that I see. But that is always a possibility. Anybody else? I think the passive betting, too, is where the officers would say, yeah, I'll give you a cup of coffee or two in the morning. And so, like, not other people could notice, but everyone notices that. Yes. So like, side bets are not just a part of the whole group, but like working little side deals, or I'll let you stay out when it's in lockdown, another hour helping clean up the pod. Or those and that is a big one. I'll let you stay out and clean up the pod. That's getting you out of your, you know, your lost cell, walk around. <clears throat> then you have, and then you're able to get some of your needs met, like, and I know they seem basic, but like toilet paper. You have to ask for that and have it brought to you. Um, and then you have some people, you know, that don't want to do it for whatever reason, or that will do it on their own time, you know. I'm not saying we should jump and, you know, uh, meet everyone's needs immediately, but that becomes a problem. Um, or the toilet paper is a big commodity, you know. Um, they will always ask for additional or covering their their walls, windows, and making dice, so. Um, do you have any questions so far? Or is this things that you guys have all heard or know? No? Okay. Um, Problems associated with gambling and potential uh, dangerous outcomes. Prison politics, unwritten rules and consequences, never to have debts. Um, you will really get hurt on that. That is a form of disrespect that also then will bring in other members within their group um, to confront you. Um, gambling on credit. This is a lot. Inmate becomes indebted to another individual and is often obligated to return the favor unwillingly or not in the future. So if someone has said, oh, I'll spot you 20 and I'll cover it if you lose, um, this is a huge problem. Because now you're indebted to someone. And not only are you indebted to them, if the roles ever reverse or if they want you to um, give them something up front, you're almost obligated to because they hooked you up when you came in. And I think that's a lot of the problem when people come in that haven't been to jail before. You, we all know who they are, and they're um, the older individuals that have been there. Um, I'm not saying older in age that have been in jail before. Um, we gravitate towards that. And so when you think you're making friends and you have somebody on your side, it's, it's quite the opposite. Um, the other safety risk, then, which was part of the example that I, that I explained, you have people that get angry. Well, no, that's not how we play in Texas. That's not how we play it in, in New York. You guys know, that's not how it goes. Or you cheated, or you didn't give me the right amount of cards. Whatever the case may be, that's usually what will spark an argument. Um, people don't like to lose, and they don't like to lose when they don't really have a lot in jail. Um, and they don't want to give that up, so they'll try any way they can to not have to pay that debt, or hoping somebody will forgive it, or they can throw a big enough fit where they will be intimidated to just let it go. A lot of times this happens, and they cannot pay the debt, and guess what happens? They kite out, which means they ask to get moved to another pod, they ask to get moved to protective custody of general population. 
Um, and a lot of times they think that by doing this, all is forgotten. Actually, you just made it worse. Not by wanting to be safe, but by wanting to skip out. When you kite out or ask to leave, you can't, a reason you can't give is I owe debt. I owe somebody commissary and I'm unable to pay on it, I'm scared. You know, then they will monitor that, but you're not gonna get moved out. When you do get moved out, so not only have you given up some of your freedom to be protected, but that's not 100% guarantee on anything. Um, word gets around. You can, tier porters can refuse to provide you dinner because you owe Frank, which is his buddy, and pot two, you owe a commissary, so we're gonna keep this until you can figure out how to pay this. Um, you have other people in protective custody that will have no problem um, making things right in another pot. Um, you'll be labeled a snitch if you tell them the true meaning of why you need to leave. And then you're adding a whole nother burden, not, a, not only upon yourself, but upon your family and friends. Who knows how much you owe, but every little bit in jail means something to people. So if you owe a lot, are your friends and family going to be harassed to make this payment? Now you have to call up your wife or husband or partner or mom and say, I screwed up, and usually that's not how it goes. It's somebody's threatening me and I have to pay them off, you know. Um, but now you have to burden them. Not only are you not providing for the family, but now the one person that's left providing for the family now has to figure out how to get money so you don't get beat up and to cover your, your expenses. And when is enough enough? It's not really not going to be. It's just going to continue all the time. Um, because now you've gone a week without commissary and because you owe somebody, but now you're trying to figure out not only how to pay them off, but how to get commissary again. Um, another thing is people will take your commissary even though, you know, it's in your cell, it's in your bunk, it's in your tote, it's in your, they don't care. They'll just kind of take what they want. And then again, you have to make the decision. Do I snitch or do I just let it happen and let it continue to happen? So I think by um, alerting people not to put themselves in this situation is, is really good. Um, so besides assault and death, death, um, also had somebody over a um, card game, and it was a it was $30 bet, um, take boiling hot water and throw it in somebody's face. I don't know job I worked at. So not only now do you have people in there for whatever they're in there for, but now they have an additional charge, possibly if we can figure out who did it and which they should, you know, cameras, but if somebody doesn't want to talk. Um, so in, um, do you guys think this is um, a new addiction for most people when they go to jail or is it something that they just continue and carry on with them when they're in prison and jail? I think it's probably a continuation of a behavior, I mean. Yeah. I, I agree, um, but I also think there, I've had quite a few that have never gambled, but because of their risky behavior pattern with substances or whatever else um, that got you know, them in trouble, that will grow. And now, you know, you can't say there's no drugs or alcohol in jail, there's hooch and there's all this, you know, but it's not as easily and readily available as in the community. So now they have to, look at what other advice can meet their, their needs. And so a lot of times it is, is, it, it is gambling. Um, a U.S. Department of Justice said there's a strong relationship between illegal behaviors and uh, pathological gambling. Inmates are three to five times more likely to develop a gambling addiction while incarcerated. And 70% 
of those individuals with gambling, pathological gambling problems, 70% um, are diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder. Um, most male inmates that do gamble, and we do have females too. However, females seem to get addicted quicker. It's not that they get addicted any more or any less, it's just quicker. Um, when, I, when I worked at the jail and became interested um, in gambling therapy and, and doing groups, um, really wanted to look at the need. And initially we did kind of what uh, Larry and Dr. Farragher both said. We, they're like, first we had to go through all these hoops, like can we, how do we assess for it? And then we had to talk with um, myself I did talk to myself about it, um, and other clinicians, like how much, we already have to do so much paperwork for the jail facility, for the mental health facility that we're contracted through, through OBH that requires, you know, their requirements, and now you want to, you really want to, you know, give me another assessment to do, seriously. And I'm like, well, it's only a few questions. It's not three pages long, it's a few questions. Um, Finally talked to people into doing that, but then a lot of um, the problems that I was finding at first is the clinicians were handing them to the inmates and said, I want you to complete these couple screening tools and I'll be back tomorrow sometime to pick them up. Oh, how do you think that went? Yeah. I want to get back to my game. I don't have time for all this. You know what I mean? Or I want to get back to whatever I'm doing. Um, and, and like we've said, nobody's going to come out and admit it. Um, it's all about delivery and how you, how you ask the questions. I would talk to people um, during the assessment, just an open conversation, I would go down the line with any sort of questions. I think after you've worked somewhere long enough, you know what's coming up and it's just kind of part of your, your mindset now. Um, but one person, he was, he was bringing it up and, and he had wrote a $10,000 check to a casino. But he, he doesn't have a gambling problem. Um, and also people, if I bring up like, what about bingo or, you know, what about scratch-offs or Powerball? Well, that's not gambling. Gambling is when you guys go to the casino. So I think a lot of times people don't even intentionally, you know, keep that information from us. They, they just don't know. And I think if we can just include that in the conversation, which is like when, you know, when we're meeting with clients and we're discussing strengths. Well, what's your strength? Oh, I'm a people person. I like to, okay. So what do you do where you're around a lot of people? Oh, I go to casino every Friday or Saturday. Perfect. Well, what do you do there? You know? And, and another thing is, is it, it goes hand in hand with uh, mental illness and substance abuse because now you're going to get free drinks. And... You're going to get a ride, buses, and it's really the only thing open. So if people are doing drugs and wide awake and, you know, that's, that's what they will turn to. You're not going to look, get looked at funny when you're wide awake at 3.30 in the morning in a slot machine because everyone else is, you know, your, your peers are with you. And it's the only thing that's, you know, acceptable. You're not going to get looked at. Like, why is he out at 3 in the morning, you know? So. Um, we did, or I did, when I worked at the jail. So after we got approval to do this assessment, it was, it was called the SOGS, and it looks different now, but this is pretty much what it was. Just one page. Um, we first did the brief bio, and they were skipping over that every time. So... We implemented this, um, and like I said, there's only, we had to get approval from, you know, Sheriff's Department, we had to get approval um, from OPH, we had to get approval from the Mental Health Center um, to get that incorporated. Then it was, okay, okay, we'll do it, um, fill it out, we'll give it to you, and just put it in the file. Okay, so I now have a whole stack of files of these. Um, I also have it in a copy of it in their in their file, but 
what are we going to do about it? So it was just that big of a push to get this part implemented and to help people. Now we don't know what to do with it. So it was like, can we start making referrals? Um, since I was one of them that has the NCGC, and I was the uh, therapist clinician there, can you know the other three therapists or two therapists or however refer to me? And then how do we do that? And how do we break it apart where they're still doing therapy with their clinician and we're not crossing any lines? And then you have me coming over simply and they, you know, well then you'll just do gambling. Okay, well we can we can work on that definitely, but as we all know, when we meet with a client that likes to talk, everything else is going to come out, and then the, there's potential problems because now you're working with like three different people, um, and you, and other clinicians don't want you to you know piggyback on what they've done um, or anything like that. And it's kind of hard to say uh, we're talking about. It's not impossible, but it is difficult at times when you're saying, no, we can't talk about this. We have to talk about gambling specifically. Well, I only gamble when I drink. And you're telling me I can't talk about my drinking. So um, that becomes a problem. So after we got um, the assessments in there, and I started flagging people um, that, on my caseload, um, that had positive influences, um, I would sit down and talk to them about this. Or, this is kind of what I'm thinking. You know, what do you think about doing therapy, adding a group? Um, would you be willing? And I'd say 97% of my caseload said absolutely. They wanted to do it. So I didn't want to take it to anyone before I had some kind of numbers and say, oh, I got one person that really, really wants to do it. Um, so then, you know, we discussed you know, how the other clinicians, how about I do just a group? We can even do it, start out once a week, once every two weeks even. I'll do it outside of my regular job duties. This will be in addition to, because um, we had a great referral source. We have tons of people sitting there gambling, and we have tons of people that really want the help, and we have a caseload already of people that are in our substance abuse and mental health program with us that we already know, you know, who's asked for help and who needs assistance in this area. And I had been there for, um, I think it was six and a half, almost seven years, and I brought it to them three different times, probably about every six months. I had this habit of just trying to revisit things and see if I get a different answer. Um, and it was always no, but I could never get an explanation as to why. Um, I don't know if it has something to do with um, the accreditation with the facility, if there's something more, because it seems like you have to get permission from, as, as you guys all know, 10 people to get one little thing moving. Um, if it's funding or the cost, and that is one thing I address uh, through OBH, or not through OBH, but I explained in the the grant and what we were doing and provided all the paperwork and we could get the funding on this. Um, I don't know the staff availability. Um, every time, you know, somebody goes to a group, there's transport. And what if someone's, you know, seeing the doctor while they're getting transported to group and then they have to come back and get that other person or somebody was in the bathroom and bring them. It is a lot of, it's a lot of work to transport. Um, and especially when you're still short staffed already. I mean, what are you going to do? Um, at first, I thought it might be a lack of engagement on the client's part because a, a lot of people don't want to admit to it. However, I've seen in the jail, people will, a lot of people will uh, sign up and want to do things to get out of the pod anyway. So I think even if you capture some of those people, and a lot of times they're like, I just want to get out of it, you know. But it has to be, it, it would have to be like a 12 week commitment. You can only, you know, miss one. It has to be for a very good reason. You need to be honest up front if you have a visitor coming or whatever's going on, just at least be honest. 
um, don't have me walk in and watch you play and catch you playing dominoes, you know. Um, we're all human and we all have, you know, it's important when people visit or whatever. Um, but I think if we, I think that's one place we need to get started on. We have a big pool of people that will engage. And most of them want to engage. Um, and we're watching this behavior continue. Um, so we're, we need to really tap into that. Um, I think when mental health institutions and facilities were closed, closing, and the jail started getting tons, started getting everybody, um, and then they were like, oh gosh, we really have to focus you know, on mental health. And, and I'm talking about in general, because I saw this when I was in Nebraska 11 years ago. They started closing, they still called them institutions, and the jails were getting flooded, and officers didn't know what to do with these people, these people, and, you know, so that, then they had, had to restructure everything and really focus on mental health, and then they were, you know, the substance abuse, and now I think if, when I was kind of, when I was discussing gambling, it was pretty overwhelming for them. You know, oh, we gotta, we're already doing, you know, health, <coughs> physical health, have to do that. Now we're doing mental health, now we're doing substance abuse, GED, what, I mean, what else do you, you know, want to bring in here? And I think a lot of times it becomes overwhelming. And I think, um, I believe if we show a, not only a need and something good, that a good result, people will be on, more apt to be on board with it. Um, just like when civilians come to work at the jail, you know, initially I was like, oh, here's the hug and bug. She's gonna come in and hug everybody. You know, nobody does any wrong, they're not gonna be held accountable, which is not true, because once they got to know us, not only do we hold them even more accountable than the officers, but we're also there to help them de-escalate so they don't go back to the unit and fight, and they use those tools. So, I think, so my goal is to show and keep chopping this around to see if there's anybody willing to give us a shot so they can see what the outcome will be. Um, there's a place in Oregon in 2005 that started a program uh, for gambling, only a gambling program in the prison. And starting in 2005, it's its um, own program within the facility, started with the women, and was called GEAR, which is Gambling Evaluation and Reduction. It became so popular, they moved it to the men, on with the men's. Um, and it's called GRIP, Gambling Reduction and Recovery of Incarcerated Populations. It's a 12-week program, you have to be dedicated, it's not just new members, just float in whenever they, you know, feel. Um, you have to be uh, disciplined and really want to do the program and be engaged. And um, so far they've had 100 inmates uh, that have completed the program successfully. It's very popular. So, with that being said, um, I didn't have a PowerPoint or, or anything like that. So, um, my name is Tammy Polk. Um, and I currently have my uh, master's, my NCGC1, and I just got finished with my stuff for NCGC2, and I'll be sending that application off next week. Um, I do feel there's a real, real need, so um, does anybody have any questions? Or I know there's people on a webinar. If people on the webinar have any questions, they can click the little hand, and somebody will unmute them to ask the question. All right, thank you for your time. I have a question. Uh, yes. What, what is the substitute since you've taken all those different pleasures away from them and the jail system would be substitute for their time, you know? For yes. Years. And my thing is more recreation, more, um, more, more things they can do that is, what's 
what I'm looking for. Um, Sorry. Something that's organized, I guess. Not just this, okay, well, we're gonna give you guys two two hours of either you can sleep or you can go run around, you know. And and I'm also not saying we should, you know, build a whole new, you know, wing and have, you know, comforts of the home there either. But there has to be something that's more organized. If they're able to organize a card game as they do behind, you know, the back of many others, I think there's some organization, like if you're out from 45 minutes, if you're out, it has to be organized, and there's your three options, and it can still be in the pot, it doesn't have to be anything outside of the event. Just to include everybody, I think that's fair. So. Thank you so much, Tim. All right, so we passed out some of the screen tools. So if you want to take those out, let's just go over those real quickly. Uh, who has the live at screening tools? So this is kind of more of the interactive workshop piece of the whole symposium that we're doing. So live at two questions. Kind of looks like a little triage grid. All right. So if you look kind of the two questions on the live at screening instrument. One, have you ever felt the need to bet more and more money? And two, have you ever had to lie to people important to you about how much you gamble? So how do you think, how to weave those into an assessment? How do you think is a nice approach? Because sometimes if you, well, I found too, asking just that question, I get a no a lot of times. No, that's not me. No, that doesn't work. So any thoughts? Good. Well, you have to normalize it first, I think, uh, as Farragher was saying earlier, to kind of say, what do you do in your free time, or how are you spending your recreation? And for some people, that might include uh, time with family, or gambling, or going to sports, or you know what I mean? Like, throw it in and normalize it a little bit so it's not an in-your-face, judgment-based question. Well, and I think a lot of times when you normalize it, and even if they say, um, I like to spend time um, if they say something like, oh, I love to spend time with my family. Well, what do you guys do? Well, when's the last time, you know? And, and a lot of times, we're like, oh, well, we go to the buffet at the Meristar, and then we'll stop by and do this. So you do this every Sunday. No, yeah, that's our family time. And I think a lot of times also when we say, how, many, how much do you gamble, or how much money do you spend? A lot of times people get angry because we're insinuating that they are gambling or do have a problem. So I think it's always good to ask. Yeah, perfect. Normalizing it, kind of, that's what the whole core concept of your time to teach was, uh, weave it into your assessment. So create it as a conversation piece, a part of asking questions. If you're asking about suicide and they're starting to talk about an incident, a past attempt, or a past history of what happened, Maybe that's a good time, but you, as a clinician, engage kind of when is that appropriate time to dig a little bit deeper when they say, oh, it was just financial reasons, right? If you kind of hear suicide, financial reasons, maybe that's a good time depending on where they're at in that assessment piece to dig deeper. So is it related to like, do you go up to the casinos? Like tell me a little bit more about that from like an MI perspective to kind of really get them just to talk about it and I guarantee when they start to talk about what is going on, that they'll start to answer these questions, no problem for you. So yeah, I went up there, I only wanted to you know, uh, play blackjack, and I had a $200 kind of allowance that I gave myself, and before you know it, I lost 2000 So that's a great indication, and when you look at the screening tools, we can't just look at them in isolation. You want to bridge them to, I also kind of passed out that DSM-5 criteria. So as you're going through each of the screening tools, when you look at this criteria, there's, what is it, uh, eight different elements now, no, nine, sorry, nine different elements. Uh, when you're going through that, do you need to gamble more with greater amount of money to kind of, you know, feel the same, right? Is that the tolerance piece of that? <coughs> For a lot of people, that would be. It's the same thing when we relate that to alcohol or substance. So when you are starting to you know, drink, do you need larger quantities to maybe get that same effect? 
that same high, that same feeling. So gambling with just that $10 or the $100 is just not the same anymore. So that 150 or 200 and taking that bigger risk step. So when you're looking at kind of those screening tools, the live bet tool, I think, is a wonderful way just to nicely ease and open up the conversation in your assessment. It's not five questions, it's not 20 questions, but it's a nice approach to just getting the conversation started. So let's say you kind of finish your assessment, there's some indication there, that's where you can kind of move on to maybe one or two of the other screening tools of your liking. Uh, one is this one that we passed out, was the brief biosocial screen. So it's kind of this one here. So when you look at it, the three questions on the brief biosocial screen, the first one is during the past year, 12 months, have you become restless, irritable, or anxious when trying to cut down on gambling? So that will help you after you start to do the assessment and say, okay, well, you know, if there's depression or anxiety or something else that's indicated, to kind of drill down a little bit more specifically, what's really happening? Is it revolving around gambling or is it because of another life situation that's going on? So we want to make sure we kind of distinguish between, you know, just financial issues of not making enough money to meet the household demands versus if there's really a gambling issue or not. So just because someone says they have financial stress doesn't mean that they have a gambling issue. So let's not make that leap. So that's why asking some of these questions and after you do the live bet to drill down. So anxious, irritable when you're stopped gaming or wagering money or even on the golf course when you know you used to play a round of golf for you know 50 bucks or so and then that um, comes to 100 or higher stakes golf games where it becomes so stressful with uh, males or females that you're golfing with that it's not even fun to go golfing anymore because you have so much riding on that game it's more stressful to even go golf and then you start to get sick maybe before you even are supposed to go out on a Saturday and do that. So when you look at kind of at number two during the past 12 months that you try to, um, to keep your family or friends from knowing how much you gamble. So are you really trying to protect and hide the fact of how much you're wagering? So are you trying to, you know, not share so much or share limited information with your spouse or family what's going on? And the third one, did you have uh, such a financial trouble that you needed help from family or friends and need to go outside of your, you know, core family system to start asking for help? So that's another one um, to keep on the radar too. So you have your live bet, you have your brief cycle, um, brief biosocial screen for gamma disorders. And the other one Dr. Berger mentioned too was the NAS clip. So hopefully all of you should have that. That's another kind of three questions. So once you start looking at all of them, it depends on which selection. I like to just not say these are the standards that I give to everyone. I think when you really individualize the approach to who you're seeing, you're able to choose the appropriate assessment tools, the appropriate screening tools for what you need to kind of dig deeper and find out. So this one for the Nods clip, the short problem gambling screen, goes, have there been periods of lasting two weeks or longer when we spend a lot of time thinking about gambling experiences or planning out future gambling ventures or bets? So it's phrased a different way. So it depends on how you work in your assessment. You might get a uh, yes indication there. Uh, again, we have the same question, have you tried to stop, cut down, or control your gambling? And then third, have you ever lied to family members, friends, or others how much you gamble or how much money you lost on gambling? So we find that is a huge, um, just protecting that and hiding. So when a client comes in and says, oh, I'm you know, 20,000 or 40,000 or 100,000 in debt, like how Tammy and Dr. Berger said, we extrapolate that sometimes two to three times that amount. So, okay, you say 100,000, we're looking at 200, 300,000 potentially. So, because if they're only starting to admit what the losses are at that first session, there might be other losses that are not accounted for yet that we have to start reconciling, kind of figuring out and going through. Um, well, a lot of, a lot of times, um, it's not that they're trying to withhold it, they just lost track. And they'll remember the big amounts that they lost, but once you sit down with them, you really start adding everything up and how much you know you lost missing work to go gamble or how to get a you know attorney for a divorce because of you really, you really start to look at the magnitude of the problem. 
Excellent. The, the last one that I want to share before we kind of really start more of the interaction is the sell those gambling screen. So everyone should have that copy. So when you dig deep a little bit in there, there's a lot more details and questions that go along with what types of games are being played. So is it playing cards for money, betting on horses, dogs, or other animals, on sports, dice games, casino games, bingo, lotteries. Um, the one part that people don't realize too, it's an investment, is the stock market, right? But it's also a gamble. So it's just a nice legal way to kind of invest your money, but you really don't have control over it, right? So you have to, as an individual, wager amount of money you feel comfortable, which is kind of your investment, into hoping that investment grows. And how many people start to get addicted to the stock market? They're waking up in the morning, watching, um, but what was the Kramer and all the different ones that are on MSNBC and the stock portfolio channels and what's my stock doing today? Is it going up or down? And do you think that causes a little bit of stress and anxiety too? Most likely, right? So when we're going through those, kind of getting a good indication if it's um, if they're playing the game it's not at all less than once a week or once or more per week really tells you kind of what their maybe favorite games are that they would like to kind of play. And um, then you can kind of dig a little bit deeper from there. So this is another uh, streaming tool. Uh, streaming tool is very common within the gambling industry, and it's a nice starting point to dig deeper after you do kind of those one or two or three questions. And you could either have this as more of a structured interview, or you could give this to you know the client to complete for you, and then review and go over it with them and work it into your um, treatment modalities there. So. Question so far is screening tools. Yeah, so, so let's say you take a client through your screening and they hit eight out of nine or two out of three or whatever. How does someone go from that and like what kind of treatment can they get? And then how does it actually, because like you're an alcoholic, you got a bad liver, and it's like, hey, this guy's got a medical problem. But So how does one go from answering a questionnaire to actually getting treatment and help and what does that look like? So starting, so that's a great question. So what is the pathway to gambling treatment? So if you start, and let's say it's kind of maybe a mild, right? You answer a few positive questions. This is what's going on. Um, how do they, if they progress through the stages and kind of get the moderate or severe indication eventually, or if they just have the mild, what treatment options are available? I think one, harm reduction and prevention model. So if these are the two or three games that you're playing, so have you tried to cut down or stay within your range of gambling? Like talking with the casinos, they bank on that um, someone retired or coming up to the casinos once a week, spending seventy to hundred dollars, right, as a form of entertainment, maybe eating, maybe spending the night, and then coming back to the city. So they would rather have that type of gambler than a problem gambler in their casino. So when you have a problem gambler in the casino, what happens? Family members file complaints. Family members are like, why are you letting my uh, spouse gamble? They're on the self-exclusion list for Colorado, right? Or they're on the self-exclusion list at the casino. So why are you letting them in the casino? Why aren't you kicking them out for trespassing? So there's a lot of the, that that happens. So kind of educating the early gambler that's starting to have issues if it's sports betting or something, how to then, um, if they can't manage that, that's kind of my feeling too with multiple pathways of recovery. If they can't manage the issue, let's say playing cards or going golf and betting, and it becomes higher and higher wages and getting in deeper, then maybe that's probably not what you should be doing right now, right? right? And so if you stop that off, and then you, you start to do that with cards, and you start to do that with lottery tickets. So at what point do we kind of cut that off and you know make that? Not happen. So it's really individualized per individual because then we have to look at the cross addictions for multiple different comorbidities that are happening as well. So it's not just kind of a standard pathway. We try to customize it and individualize it per client. Okay. And that's the great thing about them um, developing and integrating mental health and substance abuse um, with gambling because that's the problem we were finding. Is you know initially it was stated just treat gambling. It's like, well, Oh, that's that's not even possible. And I and if we really want to help people and help people help themselves and reduce recidivism and 
um, we really need to treat the whole person, not just pick parts that we, we want to pick. So. All right, so let's pair up. So if there's a couple people in the room, let's pair up. Let's talk about how to use the live that screen and actually apply and practice <coughs> that. Because I think, you know, so many times you go to different forums, educational seminars, you kind of see the tools, you hear about them, but really when you start to ask it or weave it in, say, here's how I weave it into my assessment. So let's start that conversation, figure out maybe which screen tool may work best for you to start, um, and go from there. So Tammy and I will kind of circulate, will help, and kind of um, maybe we'll play a little bit with you as well. So does, you guys have a pair, pair? Uh, there's three or so on this table. Oh, it's even number. So if one from this table could connect with someone over there. And let's get started.